morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday, March 20th meeting of the greatest show on earth, the uh, Montgomery County Board of Education Fiscal Management Committee. Uh, we've had a great agenda today. Going to dig down into a lot of the issues that um, are front and center and the work that we're doing right now to create a system that is um, operationally excellent in all ways and fiscally responsible. So I, before we get started, I'm going to make sure everybody uh, at the table here is introduced. So I'm just going to turn to my colleagues. Good morning, Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. Good morning, everyone. Julie Yang, District 3. Happy to be here today. We'll just go around the table. Good morning, Tom Lockman, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff to the Board. Good morning, Shannon Pattybutt, Senior Analyst to the Board. Becky Gibson, Board Administrative Secretary. Good morning, Rob Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance. Brian Holt, Chief Operating Officer. And I guess I should introduce myself. I am Lynn Harris. I use she, her pronouns, and I chair this committee. Um, and do, we can just jump right in here. Uh, first thing on the agenda is an informational summary of our January 29th meeting. Are there any comments, edits, changes to that? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move right along to um, just one of the most interesting things that we do here, one of the things that um, we are required to do annually through this committee, the only committee that uh, the state of Maryland requires all boards of education to have, and that is getting into our Category 12 expenses and how we report those. Mr. Riley. Thank you. So before I uh, jump into Category 12, I just kind of want to uh, put it a little in context. So um, as you know, our operating budget is organized by chapters, right? Um, but for state uh, requirements, we uh, we organize also by categories. There's another way we, we split up our budget. Um, and that's how actually the county appropriates the budget is by category. So one of the, the tools or one of the uh, the ways they have to oversee our budget is looking at specific categories. Um, and one of the things we do, and I don't know if a lot of other LEAs do this, is two times a year we report on our category 12 expenditures. And one of the uh, times is March 31st. Um, and we're going to uh, send a letter on March 31st. But I'm going to give you a brief overview of what's in that letter. Um, and then again in September, when we do our final uh, 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 annual comprehensive financial report. We report on the actuals in that category 12 as well, too. So just another way that we're transparent in addition to the monthly financial report, which we discussed last night at, at the board table. So, so category 12 expenditures. So um, as Ms. Harris mentioned, we've been doing this since 2012, um, and it's two times a year. Um, on uh, category 12. So just, so when, I, when we say category 12, um, what we're talking about, it's, it is in the budget book. It's in chapter 10. If you recall, when I was talking about the finance chapter, uh, our benefits reside in there. So um, the, the expenses in, in chapter 10 finance are uh, higher than everybody else's because we, we include all the benefits there. Um, so if you look at chapter 10, page 30, um, it's a listing of uh, the things that we'll be talking about today, which are our Category 12 expenditures. So um, so that, that gives you an idea of what we're talking about and what's in there. Um, and it includes such things as workers' compensation, uh, our self-insurance, our Social Security payments, and our FICA, um, our uh, payments from the operating budget to the active uh, insurance fund, as well as the payments to the retiree fund. Um, also in there is our uh, state retirement contribution and our uh, retirement and administrative fees, as well as unemployment and other things such as tuition reimbursement. So that's kind of the, the bundle of uh, items that we're talking about. So uh, the first part, there's a few different components of that March 31st letter. And, uh, next slide, sorry. And next slide. So the first thing is the summary of the, of, of the board's current strategy to a, achieve that desired pension funding level, uh, short and long-term effects, and the strategy on the K-12 budget. So uh, a lot of the focus over the last couple of months has been on our employee benefit plan and health re and health pay payments. Uh, but pension is always, it's, it's a big uh, chunk out of our budget as well, too. Um, when, when this first started in 2012, uh, there was a goal to make sure we were 80% funded in our pension uh, plan. Um, 
and just so, so that the public knows too, when I talk about our pension, uh, half of our, our teachers are in our state retirement pension plan, but we also have a pension plan for our uh, non-teachers and, and other folks, um, as well as a supplemental plan, uh, retirement plan that applies to everybody. So we kind of sometimes talk about it uh, interchangeably, but there are distinctions there. Um, so they they want to know what in in our pension fund, what's you know what are we going to do to get that to 80 percent? Well, we we met 80 percent somewhere between 2012 and now. In fact, two years ago we actually had it 90 percent funded uh, because when the market was doing so well. Because a lot of that is based on actuarial reports where um, you know they look at what is that rate of return, and a good a good rate of return is going to increase. The, the value of that fund and increase your percentage funded. Um, so so that, that's our pension plan. They also, part of this letter, the next component is they want to look at uh, what a five-year lookout is for that pension plan, uh, which is always a good idea, and, and we do that. We provide, uh, again, from our actuaries, they look at what are our estimated contributions going to be for the next five years, uh, which is helpful because as we're doing, you know, we do our budget annually, but we would like to know, is that going to be increasing over the next five years? Is it going to be steady or is it going to be decreasing? Um, and actually, ours uh, did decrease uh, a little bit. You know, when the market was high, the actual then contribution actually came down a little. Um, so that that's part of that five-year look. Um, it. Truthfully, you know, uh, you know, I'll talk about the next parts of these, but I think we should be doing the same thing for a retiring and active fund. And actually, we've been having those conversations, and I think it's, you know, based on what we're talking about, it has come up. We've said it numerous times in order to make that uh, the health care fund sustainable. We really have, have to have sustainable um, inputs, uh, injections of like $40 million a year. Um, so um, I might... Um, not for this one, because this one's already done. But in the future, I think we're gonna, we'll do a five-year uh, projection for that as well, too. I think it's the same intent as what we talk about for the pension. So uh, that's, that's to come, I guess. Uh, and then so the other things that we look at are the major factors that affect the estimated pension fund contributions. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. As I said, I think you know, we should incorporate that into our health care fund as well, too. Um, currently, what's in that letter is a comparison of our budget versus actual for the active and the retiree group insurance funds. And that we've been talking about a lot. Um, we, we've actually uh, gone into a, a uh, spending restriction uh, right now because we know we're projecting that it's going to be in a negative by the end of this year in our active and retiree funds. So, so we have discussed that. Um, and that will be, you'll see that uh, as part of this letter as well, too. And then again, uh, projected year in balance. You know, what, what, will there be a fund balance or what are we going to do if it does go negative? So those are the components of the letter. Um, so that, uh, next slide, please. So this gets into the details of, uh, uh, particularly about our uh, pension fund. So these are, uh, when the, when the actuaries do this, um, it, it takes them a while, and they create a report that we share with the board in November. In our November Fiscal Management Committee meeting, we have our actuaries uh, talk about pension as well as OPEB. Uh, when I say OPEB, that's other post-employee benefits. Basically what that is, it's our retirement fund um, over the long a long period. Um, so the retiree fund that we use right now, it's a trust that we pay our um, the claims for retirees. That gets rolled up into the OPEB fund. The OPEB fund, uh, the, the county actually makes that large contribution. Um, and just so you guys know, I, I talked about our pension fund being um, over 80, but now a little slightly under 90. The OPEB fund is at 27 percent, uh, which you know, compared to 90, seems like, wow, that, we got a long way to go. But compared to other LEAs, we are one of the top, because um, some of the LEAs aren't even funding OPEB. So, um, so relatively to 27% is a pretty good number. So uh, back to pension. Uh, so these are some of the things that the actuaries look at when they're determining what that cost uh, for the pension is going to be in future years, you know, 40 years from now. So they look at our salaries. They look at... Um, uh, different things such as uh, change in our, the size of our work, workforce, uh, our investment performance, which we talked about. You know, if we have great investment performance, that the pension fund percentage uh, is going to be better. And then it also looks at mortality rates, turnover rates, inflation. Um, so one of the other things that we do is every five years we revisit all of these. So um, it's already been five years. Uh, 
Uh, so we're going to be uh, doing this again in the next year. We're going to be revisiting all of these uh, assumptions, and that's part of the, it's called a five-year uh, uh, pension assumption, and we're going to be doing that. Next slide, please. So that's pension. Uh, so then for the actives, you know, what, what's required in this letter is just to look at, uh, you know, how we're doing, you know, on a year-to-year -year basis. So uh, you can see here uh, um, the, the bad news. So we started this year out with, uh, in the actives, minus $11 million. Um, we project that we're going to have another $20 million decrease due to that increased uh, rates as well as increased utilization. And by the end of the year, uh, we, we're projecting uh, $32 million negative. Um, we do have a plan, and that is to use savings from the expenditure restriction uh, to address that. Uh, we also use some of our uh, unassigned fund balance this year, $5 million. That's going to go directly towards that as well, too. Um, and then for the retirees, uh, not as bad a situation there, but uh, we started off $10 million. We're uh, projecting $19 million uh, negative there to end again with a loss there of uh, negative $8.6 million. So, so um, Mr. Riley, if you yeah. could just very briefly share, um, so we're looking at a healthy pension fund balance. You know, yes. 90, almost 90% 90 funded. And we're in deep trouble when it comes to our uh, active and retiree group insurance funds. So for the lay public, what's the difference there? Um, the difference is, so the, the OPEB fund, and let me, let me distinguish. So OPEB, I was saying, is OK, because even 27 percent. Um, uh, can you not use OPEB? Can you let the wider o uh, yeah, audience? Other post-employee benefits. Yeah, is that, that's that's the, uh, the other post-employee benefit fund. Um, we're relatively healthy there. Um, but one of the reasons why it takes a while to get to that 90 percent, and we'll get there eventually, um, it's because it's uh, kind of, they call it an immature fund. So there hasn't been enough years to gain that balance as, as we go along. It's going to take multiple years of contributions, which I had mentioned the county makes for us, into the OPEB fund um, to get to a higher percentage there. Um, and that's, and that, the reason why is because um, we started reporting OPEB six or seven years ago now. Um, and what happened was um, the, the uh, government accounting folks said, you got everybody in the country has to start reporting this on their books. People weren't. People were just paying other post-employee benefits from PAYGO or money that they had in the bank at the time and not putting money aside like, like we do for pensions. And what happened was a lot of uh, uh, cities and, and counties were going out of business because they couldn't afford to make those payments. They were going bankrupt. So the accounting uh, world stepped in and said, we need this uh, to be on your books, and you have to address how you're going to do those long-term liabilities. Um, so, so OPEB, 27%, uh, OK there. But back to what we're what we're talking about now is our immediate needs. What you're looking at here is not OPEB. This is our active uh, fund, which I'll, I'll talk about that in a later presentation. It's actually an internal service fund. Um, and then when we're talking about retirees here, we're not talking about OPEB. We're talking about these are two separate trusts, and this is what we make the current year payments for uh, claims out of. Um, so that is um, that, that's the situation we're facing now. And Ms. Harris, to address your question, so um, so for pension, you know, we kind of have it established what those, you know, we get a bill every year from the state. We know what that's going to be. That's in our budget. Um, but with the recent increases, you know, large multi-digit, multi-year increases in uh, our health care rates and utilization, that's kind of what's putting us behind the eight ball in the health fund. Robin, and that's the difference. I know everyone at the table understands what OPEP is, but could you explain what's What's in OPEB for the folks yeah. that are listening? Yeah, sure. So, so OPEB, other post-employee benefits. The large part of it is is health insurance, um, but also in there is other benefits as well too, such as uh, life insurance. Um, all all the other insurances are rolled up in there too, and that's what that that fund is used to to pay out benefits to our retirees over the course of time. So it's similar concept to pension, um, but it's. Um, it's OPEB, I guess, part of that definition. It's everything but pension. Exactly. Yeah. When we start with a negative balance and working, you know, to fix that and whatever, what is there any effect on our employees at all? 
Uh, no, because we haven't had the situation where we can't make payments. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit. So that negative $11 million, um, that's an accounting balance. It's in our uh, uh, annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, but just like uh, accrual accounting, what happens is at the end of the year, the um, actuaries and the healthcare consultants come up with what our IBNR, and uh, that, that's incurred but not reported. So what are, what are going to be expenses over the next 60 days? And that gets reported on there. So what you're looking at there is that negative 11. That ends up being what we ended up paying in July. Uh, because each each month it's like a 40, uh, we're paying out uh, 40 million dollars. So, so that's kind of an accounting entry. But if if that happens for multiple years, and we've seen it, um, you know, some of our, uh, I know of a couple of other LEAs, it started out like this, and over a few years, then they had a cash balance, and that that does affect our employees. That's the case where um, uh, the county would say, hey, if you get into that situation, just come to us, and we'll help you make that payment. We don't want to be in that situation. <laughs> Um, so, so from a cash perspective, we're not there yet, uh, but we could be very soon if we don't turn that around. Mr. Riley, right yes. now, uh, for our employees, can you remind us, for our employees, what is the uh, percentage contribution of their salary to health insurance? Yeah, so, so that is what you're talking about is the cost share. Yeah. So we're looking at this fund in total, mm -hmm. um, but as you, as you are alluding to, we, get a we make a contribution from MCPS, the employer, mm -hmm. and then we have an employee contribution as well, too, similar to the pension. Like, we make an employer contribution, and mm -hmm. folks pay for the pension each month, too. Mm -hmm. So that percentage right now, if they're in our uh, HMO plan, mm -hmm. um, it is uh, 12%. Uh, 12% is the employee and 88% is the, um, the uh, system share. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if they are in the PPO plan, it is 17% uh, for the employee and 83% for, for MCPS. Then I'm amazed you can remember that on top of it. <laughs> it took me a second there. So. Yeah. And I want to ask for our employee pensions, what is the percentage of contribution? So, so that's seven and a half percent. So seven percent is for the 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 pension, and that 0.5 uh, percent is for the supplemental pension, which I, I had uh, mentioned before. Everybody is entitled, or it's assuming they meet the qualifications, would get that supplemental pension. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have to have 10 years vested, um, but then the the seven percent also, and we we equate that to what the the state charges for the teacher's pension. So, in fact, much of the assumptions, we try to match it exactly what's in our pension and what's in the state pension for the assumptions. We talk about assumptions for the uh, health plan. There's also a lot of assumptions for the pension plan as well. Thank you. I have one more question. Sorry. Sure. I hesitate to ask this, but um, you said, when, to, you, in the answer to my question, you mentioned if you don't make it up, you know, then we could potentially be in trouble years going forward. How are you planning on making it up? Um, so, so we're, you know, we've, we've done that expenditure restriction for the rest of this year. Right. Um, we do, uh, we are, we do have $40 million in the budget, um, in the board's tentative budget for next year, which is that first 40. We, we're looking at it as multiple years. But for this year, um, uh, you know, we do have to make, cuts other areas, we're going to have to make that payment. Uh, we do uh, have some other savings um, that we could uh, resort to, too, but um, it's going to be close. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm looking at our cash on a daily basis. So. <laughs> and I would just add, um, you know, this is a long-term issue. Uh, it didn't crop up overnight. Um, there are, you know, many things that led to it over the past several years, and it's going to take multiple years to work our way out of it. Um, and one of the things is, you know, looking at our um, insurance plan. And so we've already, uh, you know, broached that subject with our uh, employee associations and are going to work together um, because I think they understand that if we don't do something to curb these costs, I mean, 
we can keep dumping revenue in there, but if we don't do something to curb the uh, cost curve, then it's just going to eat up a larger and larger share of our budget each year, which is going to restrict uh, what we can do for our employees as far as raises go. It's going to impact what we can do for our students as far as services, direct services to students. And so it's in everyone's best interest to make sure that we get this into a sustainable place. And so we'll work collaboratively with our uh, unions and make sure that everyone is at the table, has their voice heard, and that we are able to make some changes that positively benefit both our employees and the system. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Yep, thanks. And I just want to, so even I am still sitting here, and I, you know, look at this stuff all the time, and I'm a little confused. So we started out saying something is 90% funded, or almost 90% funded, yay. Something is 27% funded, then we're in the hole. So what are these three things for the people out there and the people who might want to understand how is MCPS working to provide the, the pension and other benefits, including health care payments, to our employees and retirees? So 90% first, 27% first, then I think we all get that our um, um, health trust funds are in a pickle. Yep. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll go from the 90% first. So 90% is our pension fund. So that fund's been around for a long time. Uh, we make contributions not only to um, to pay out our, our retirees their pension currently, but we're also put money away to make sure that we can do it in the next 30, 40 years. Um, so that's called the, the unfunded liability, um, which we make payments towards that on an annual basis, too. Um, so when, when we say 90% funded, if, let's say we didn't do that for a few years. It, that, that, it's kind of a barometer of where we are. Um, that funded ratio will go down, but we'd never be in a position where we can't make our pension payments to our retirees. So, um, so using that same barometer analogy, our OPEB, other post-employee benefits, is 27%. You know, that, that's, that's getting there. Um, it would be many, many years before we'd be in a situation where we couldn't make our retiree health care um, payments um, for the long term. But now I'm, I'm talking about uh, this year. And, and the reason for that is because the county contributes. You know, when we look at the retiree uh, fund, um, you know, you saw it, it's going to be negative. What that's going to roll up, the, the county's going to add 30, 40 million dollars to that and then put it in that OPEB trust, that OPEB plan. Um, so whatever we end up with on our annual cash flow basis, the county is going to supplement that and put that in the that, that trust. And that is going to grow over years. Um, but then the, the immediate concern we were talking about was our active trust, um, which is which supports our active payment, that internal service fund. And that's the one where we got to be very careful to make sure that we can make those payments on an annual basis. Um, that one, there is no, you know, the, the county's not going to sweep in and say, well, they say they, they would, but um, we don't have that where they're going to supplement $60 million and it's going to go aside. That one we have to address on a on a year-to-year -year basis. So that that's the one that we got to be very careful about. A couple of things different this year is in the past, um, as you know, we had uh, uh, we were working on saving for a $25 million generally fund balance um, to use to help support the balance in uh, the budget in the next year. In essence, that correlates to we, we kind of had $25 million saved in the bank that we could have used for this. Um, so as Ms. Mondraski was mentioning, now that's not gone. So now, you know, that's, I'm losing my hair here because uh, we're looking, we don't have that in the bank. Like that savings account is gone. So now we're looking at our checking account and saying, can we make the next month's payment? Um, so that, that's kind of the difference in uh, risk and difference in uh, uh, the assets in each of those accounts. I just want to clarify that 25 million is gone is because we last year we have to roll that into our operating budget to make our budget work. Yeah, it was one of the, you know, remember at the end of the year uh, we were trying to find $80 million. So part of that plan was using using that $25 million fund balance and then we had to do other cuts as well too. But that was part of that plan to balance last year's budget as well as moving stuff to ESSER which, yeah. you know, so we talked about now we're bringing back. Remind people what 
happen with that $25 million? Yes, yeah. And we're kind of in new territory. Uh, I think there's one other LEA on the, on the eastern shore that, that does not have a, a fund balance they use to help balance the next year's budget. So it's it's new area here for us. But, uh, you know, but like I said, I'm looking at cash every day, and we're looking at projections. We're looking at the projections for this EBP fund. We're in constant communication with uh, our health care consultant, as well as Cigna, that they're a new uh, uh, plan. So. Thank you very much. And moving on, we are going to talk about the operating budget, which has been a hot topic lately, especially since uh, the uh, county executive last Thursday made his first shot over the bow. Yeah, so this is a good tie-in because we've kind of alluded to some of the things in the operating budget now. But um, I don't know if you if we have the slide deck. All right, and next slide. All right, so, so what we'd like to do in this fiscal management committee meeting each year is kind of look at what was uh, the board's uh, tentative adopted budget in uh, February to what the, uh, um, uh, to what the, no, not February, uh, January, to, to what the uh, county executive proposed. So there, there you can see the comparison. So last year's budget, 3.165. Uh, this year in the tentative, we were 3.353. Uh, we were... Um, proposing an increase of 188 million or 5.9 percent more than the prior year, um, and the county executive's recommendation was uh, 3.293, which equates to 128 million dollars more or a 4 percent increase. So uh, that's the big numbers. Uh, next slide, I'll give you a little more detail um, because the, the uh, next slide, please, because the county uh, budget is just one. The local contribution is just one piece of our revenue. So uh, well, this was the one we were waiting for. So yeah, but if you in on that, that first slide, that means that the difference between what we we're asking for based on what we need and what the county executive is, has currently proposed is $60 million. You got it. $60 million. Yep. yep. So, th so this breaks it out a little bit into the different components of our revenue. So uh, last month we found out what the governor, what the state uh, gave us and uh, Remember, that was actually, we had $10 million in the superintendent's budget, uh, but we got $38.1 million. So that's what's showing in the board's requested budget. Uh, federal revenue uh, stayed the same between the board's requested and the county recommended. The enterprise fund, that's, that's you know, that looks a little odd. The board was requesting 11.2, and the county executive recommended 6.8. Uh, between the superintendents and the board sensitive adopted, we actually increased it $4.4 million. I'll talk about this a little later when we talk about enterprise funds, uh, but it's directly related to the estimate of the camera, the bus camera uh, revenue uh, piece of that enterprise fund. And that's an estimate that the county made. So originally they were thinking it was going to go up 4.4, so we, we bumped up superintendents, uh, but then now they realize it was. Uh, Something was uh, wrong in the estimate. So that's just a technical adjustment, basically, that 4.4. Um, so as Ms. Harris mentioned, the bottom line is there's a difference of $60.1 million there. Take the 4.4 out, and what we're looking at is a gap of $55.7 million, that top line there. Um, so that's what you know we're facing right now. And and the reason we say take the 4.4 out is because that was a, a pass through. So the county told us to increase the revenue and the expenditures by 4.4 million. And then they came back and said, oh, that was an error. Take that out. So it's a reduction of 4.4 million in revenue, also a reduction of 4.4 in expenses. And so that's where you go from the 60.1 million to the 55.7, is that not only did we lose that revenue estimate, but we also, the expenses that go with it. And so we have the 60, but when we talk about the gap, it's the 55.7 million that we need to close. So basically that was sort of a budget neutral thing. It was a budget neutral thing, yep, and that turned out to just be in, in error. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, expenditure slide. It's a little more busy than this. So, uh, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think this one just reiterates the, what I had mentioned before. Um, so the total uh, county executive budget was the 106.9, which you saw on that previous slide. Um, and then, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was looking in my bag. I'm like, these numbers don't look the same as last night's. Yeah, yeah, that 106.9 you probably saw on the, yeah. you know, that's what the county executive was showing and all. So that's how that ties in. Um, uh, let's see. And then so on this one, um, so one particular point here, you're going to see on the next slide, too, 
Um, this year, a little different than in prior years, the county executive was a little prescriptive on what we should reduce to kind of fund that gap. Um, so, but in his documentation, he acknowledges that this is just, he relies on the Board of Education to make the best decisions on how to allocate the funding that we have. Um, so we're not, we're not bound by anything that, that um, he has in there. Um, it's just his recommendations, but we do have to meet that gap. Um, so that, that's what that point means. Um, and then also to, uh, just to reiterate, this is, it exceeds the maintenance of effort by an amount greater than the increase. And that's because over the last couple of years since COVID, they've kind of uh, fooled around with the maintenance of effort, and that's the MOE formula. Um, normally, you, you're gonna get an, if you have an increase in enrollment, you're gonna get an increase in the maintenance of effort, which is the baseline of what the county has to appropriate. Um, it's been a little tricky the last couple of years because of COVID, uh, enrollments have fluctuated you know there's a few schools where enrollment actually went up but most schools it went down so they've been making the formula a little more complicated they're looking at the last three out of four years uh, so technically the county could have given us a negative amount or less than what they gave us last year um, so that's what um, and that was in the county executives uh, proposal or um, letter too that hey this is uh, above maintenance of effort by um, and that's that 132 $0.8 million that he's talking about there. Uh, the last piece, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this um, in the next slide. So $27.2 million, and I'll tell you how this relates. It's, this gets a little uh, in the weeds, but $27.2 million. Remember we were talking about the, the funding or the revenue sources for a retiree fund? So in that retiree fund, our employees pay their core share, um, or the retirees, and the retirees actually by the way, is a higher cost share than it. We, we talked about the actives. Here we're talking about retirees. Their um, cost share ranges between 36, 50, or 60%, depending on when they retired. Um, so in, the, uh, in that fund, not only do we get that, the employees, we contribute as an employer, but then the county, about seven or eight, uh, almost 10 years ago now, they started contributing an amount of $27.2 million to that retiree fund. Um, it, it's, uh, so before when I was talking about when our actuaries determine what that amount is that the county's gonna pay, normally it's around $60 million. What they've done, and you know, with, with our request, I am assuming, I wasn't here 10 years ago, is out of that 60, they take $27.2 million and say you can use this for that retiree plan that we were talking about. Remember, we were talking about the different levels. So instead of putting that in the trust, it goes to help pay our current year retiree benefits, $27.2 million. So um, that you'll see when they, when they send our budget uh, each year, it says in addition to the budget, because this is outside of the budget, it's outside of MOE, it's just another payment that they're making to us to help us make this payment. Um, you'll see it says in addition, we're gonna pay you that $27.2 million. So um, we'll talk about that a little more on the next slide too. So any, any questions on this slide? I know, I know we're talking a lot of uh, numbers here in the morning, but uh, so this next slide um, is gonna show our expenditures. Uh, I'll start from the bottom first. So if you recall, the revenues uh, were the 187.9 for the tentative adopted budget, and then the 127.8 for the county executive recommendation. So this is how we've been showing the different buckets of our expenditures uh, so we, we just figured it'd be good to kind of uh, show that uh, with the boards requested and looking at the county executive recommended. So very first line, uh, county continuing salaries and benefits. So we had in there $119.5 million in the board's budget, and that consisted of uh, a few different components, but the main components were um, the salaries to the negotiated salaries to our associations and our staff, the 100 was $79.5 million. In the superintendent's budget, we made that $99.5 million. And then when we received our that increase from the state, that additional $28 million more than what we were expecting, we used 20 to that to get to that 119. So 79 plus the 20 for employee benefits from the superintendents plus the 20 from the board's budget got us to the 119.5. And we were doing this uh, because we know that it's a multi-year problem in that employee benefit plan. So let's be real clear. Yeah. You yeah. just talked about, um, we're looking at the 119.5. You just talked about what we need for salaries, given the, the, the increases that we've 
programmed in when we passed the when we came to the two year negotiated agreement last year. So we need seventy nine point five million for salaries, but we also pay benefits. Right. So there's twenty million dollars that we programmed in for benefits. Mm -hmm. Twenty the superintendent did, and then another twenty from the board. So that's where we got to the. That's how we got to the right. one nineteen point. So we started out with a, with an additional twenty million dollars, realizing that we need we have that obligation to pay benefits. So that was included in the operating budget recommendation. Correct. Then we saw that what um, we were planning on um, our state share being just ten million. We saw that was actually thirty eight million. So we took a big chunk of that additional twenty eight million and put it. Here in the benefits, correct. So Twenty million. Yeah. So that was so that gave us forty million to put into employee benefits. Which is that? That's the target. That's where we kind of want to be. That's our target. Given the trust funds, the healthcare trust funds this year are in a pickle. Yep. And so, what the county executive has put in is salaries, the seventy-nine point five for salaries, mm -hmm. and the initial twenty million. That's right. Not the additional. Correct. Twenty million that we wanted to put in there from the state, the state share that we were getting. Mm. That's correct. Getting there. Okay. Mm. Yeah. All right. And, and <clears throat> excuse me. So just to be clear, um, forty million is what we need just to meet this year's obligations, and so this isn't even starting to, you know, uh, address the deficit. Um, back in November during open enrollment, we passed on a nine percent increase to our employees for their health. Anyone who has health insurance, because that is what Aon, our benefits administrator projected our cost increase to be. So they said, you're going to see, you know, approximately uh, a 9% cost increase for calendar year 2024. Uh, so uh, all the employees saw that 9% increase. It hit their paychecks January 1st of 2024. For us, uh, a 9% increase in the employer benefit uh, uh, portion is $40 million. Mm -hmm. So we pay about $450 million a year in health insurance. 9% of that is $40 million. And so that is just the 9% that we passed on to our employees. That's our portion of that. Now, unfortunately, part of what is leading to uh, the deficit that we have is when we look at actual costs coming in. And so, you know, we, we pay Aon, uh, you know, they're a national, international firm that does this for a living, and we pay for their expertise to help us gauge what these cost increases are going to be. They projected a 9% cost increase, and of course, no one has a crystal ball. Currently, we're looking at about a 12% cost increase. We can't, obviously, and don't want to go back and pass on that additional 3% to our employees. So we as a system have to have to eat that money. That uh, so, if the if the estimate is low, um, you know we have to make up that difference, and so that's additionally what is contrib one of the factors that's contributing to uh, the troubles that we're having. Do we get a kickback because they got it wrong, or is it just that's just the way it goes? We are going to have some conversations with them about how they have done this two years in a row now. Awesome, good, and and other companies to see what they could do to help out, but. Absolutely. I just wanted to say that that was very helpful, what you just explained. So thank you. Um, so next line down, grants and enterprise fund, we kind of already addressed. I'm sorry, the previous slide. Um, uh, one more. Uh, another slide one. Slide five, sorry. please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Five, five, next slide, please. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, so grants and enterprise funds, we already talked about. That's a wash. That you know, that's seven point seven million dollars. So efficiency reduction. So um, you know, as, as we've been talking about over the last two years, we've made uh, multiple series of uh, efficiency reductions or, or cuts. Um, this year, it was uh, in the superintendent's budget. It was uh, fifty-six uh, staff. Um, at a higher amount. Uh, the board did uh, add back uh, seven positions, so that's why we're looking at the, the board's budget. It was 49.6 uh, FTEs uh, at an amount of $14.1 million. And the county executive agreed with that. He said, yeah, that's good. He's going he's gonna to leave that. Um, and, and he also agreed with the uh, bringing back the uh, ESSER, um, that $33.1 million and $101.8 um, That was intact from what the board's uh, budget was as well, too. Um, and then, but the accelerators, uh, which were 
here we included accelerators and blueprint. Um, we were at $111 million and 12.8, or 111 FTEs, $12.8 million. Um, he's funding just the blueprint portion, which is largely uh, pre-K of the 8.2. If you recall, that other 11 were things such as uh, uh, we had uh, compliance, we had staff in there, we had um, uh, uh, directors in OSSWB. Um, so that other $4 million um, he didn't address or he didn't recommend that in his uh, recommendation there. So, so I, I, just, I just want to stop you right there because um, building up the capacity of our compliance and investigation office is something that is universally of universal interest and uh, the board I think has been quite clear that's non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. And um, also, the, since the only real work of central office is to support schools, increasing our cadre of directors who directly support principals in schools is, is mission critical to do okay. this okay. work well. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we look at that, that's, that's real areas of work that I don't think anybody in the county would say you should not do that. Right. So maybe that is a place to sort of start some of this conversation because I don't think the county executive would say, no, don't support schools better. I don't think the county executive would say, no, do not improve and professionalize your Department of Compliance and Investigation. Um, so I think sometimes I think we need to take it away from the numbers and to the story. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Riley, what I will appreciate is if after today's meeting, you can give me a list of what that $4.6 million cover, what are the positions, what are the areas. I think that will help us being the advocate for the school system to uh, to engage in meaningful conversations with. Yeah, and, and um, we do have it, uh, you know, in these slides, we've combined it, but in the letter, in the final letter, you'll see accelerators where we break out just that accelerators other than blueprint. So it's, it's in one of the letters that went with the board center of adopted budget, but I'll forward that just forward so we that. have that in detail. Yeah, um, yeah, because it's, you know, like you said, it's, we had very few accelerators this year, but we made, they were very important, all of them. So, um, but that, that's what I was saying before. These are, uh, uh, recommendations from the county executive, not necessarily anything that we would want to do. Um, I think part of the calculus of, of uh, the county executive coming up with this number is um, they were not going to do another tax increase. So so the amount that they provided was without doing a tax increase um, after after the, you know, we had one last year. So, um, so that was part of that decision, I think. Um, but then there were some, like I said, the, there are some prescriptive uh, reductions there. Um, county executive uh, suggested or recommended cutting virtual academy in half. Um, I think that's $2.1 million he had in there for that. Staff development teachers, uh, he mm -hmm. suggested cutting $10.6 million. And contractual services, he didn't specify which contractual services, uh, but he wanted to reduce that by $7 million. So that's where his recommended reductions were the minus 19.7. Um, and then just to kind of do the math, if you look, if you're following down in that last column, um, the, the top six lines there are what was in his recommendation specifically. Um, the other component there was our, you know, when we compare revenues and expenditures, um, the, the non-local supported uh, a revenue increase was $13.1 million. In other words, we were talking about the increase to state that went up $28 million, um, uh, or, or is, is 38. This is not considering that state funding. Um, so we kind of had to add that in to get to the 127.8. Uh, it's a little confusing, but, but in other words, some of our state funding is gonna uh, address some of the, the, the shortfalls that the county executive mentioned. You know, we have $38 million to address some of the things that that he didn't uh, cover, um, but um, we still got to deal with it. And not to mention, he didn't cover anything for inflation, rate changes. Um, you know, we enrollment. It was a small amount this year because enrollment, our general enrollment, actually went down, and our um, special ed and EML enrollment went up. So we had almost a million dollars in enrollment increase, and then we had additional uh, school space for 3.2. So the county's recommendation didn't uh, address any of that 24, $25 million there. So 
Uh, and just to try to add a little bit more clarity, the 13.1 million you see there, that's the 38 million in state aid, the additional 38 million in state aid, less the 25 million in fund balance that we no longer have. So the 25 million is included in this year's budget. It's not available for next year, so that it, that's a negative 25. So you get the 13 by taking the 38 million minus the 25. So it's the state aid less the fund balance. Um, That's the non-local supported expense. Say that again. Yep. Nobody knows what that means. Yes, yeah, say that again because I'm trying to <laughs> capture yeah, that. So it, it's um, the non-local, so it's the state funding, okay. so $38 million in state funding, and then uh, minus the $25 million in fund balance. So this year's budget includes $25 million in fund balance that won't be available next year. So before we budget dollar one next year, we're in a $25 million gap because this year's budget has one-time funding of $25 million that won't be there next year. And so that's where that number comes from, the state funding less the $25 million for um, uh, the fund balance. So and it's an increase of $13 million for us in terms of state funding. To help, yep. to help yeah. do what, what the county executive didn't recommend. Right. In, in a nutshell, what it comes down to, if we want to keep all the, the, the needs and all that the, the board's tentative adopted budget uh, you know, was, was attempting to meet, we'd have to come up with that $55.7 million if we want to get back to where we were with the board's tentative uh, budget. And the, sorry, the other thing to just point out is even though um, things like inflation and additional space weren't included in the CE's recommendation, I mean, those are things that we have to address first before we look at anything else just to maintain the services that we're providing now. Otherwise, the service level goes down. We're either, you know, enrollment, that's a lot of uh, services and additional staff for special ed and EML. So if we don't provide that, then, you know, you're going to have increased ratios in those two areas, which none of us want to see. Uh, we've already added the new school space. So if we're going to keep it clean um, and, you know, uh, hire enough teachers to teach the kids, we need that. And then obviously inflation, just to provide the same services next year, it costs more. So if we're not going to fund that 20.5 million, that's also going to be a reduction in services. And so even though none of that, which comes out to be, what, almost $25 million is included, we have to include that in our budget unless we're going to reduce services to children. Right. right. And that, I think, is an important thing to keep front of mind when we are having these conversations, um, because those are just the, the, the realities. It's like we can't magically make kids disappear um, and, and so reduce the services that we have to provide. Um, and I think one thing, too, um, I think on the contractual services piece, I know our very first um, uh, operating budget work session, the, the board did raise the issue about mm -hmm. the, the amount plugged in uh, for contractual services in next year in, in the FY25 budget is, a dr is dramatically increased, and we had the conversation about why. Mm -hmm. And I think really we need to focus very, very directly on that on that, why are these services here? What specifically are they going to be paying for? Mm -hmm. And why is it necessary for that to be, for that budget to go up so much this year? Because I think that is the, that's the narrative that people need to understand. Right. Um, just out of curiosity, more than anything else, um, the additional school space, new classes, is that for only space that is going to be completed by July 1st, or does that incorporate ones that work? Just, just for next fiscal year. So uh, when we say school space, it, it's uh, grade five at Cabin John. Um, but it's not just it's not just that. It's a Cabin Branch. <laughs> it's additional uh, uh, space throughout the system, too. Um, but that's the only uh, school space that we're talking about. And, but yeah, we're not looking at the next five years. It's we're doing that on, on an annual basis. Yeah. It seems really high. <laughs> it, it, so it includes uh, the new space, um, some new staff for the fifth grade. Uh, it includes um, building service, additional building service staff for the new space and supplies. It also includes additional food service workers for schools that are now going to be CEP. So they're going to be serving a lot more meals. And so we needed to add additional staff there as well. So it's, uh, you know, a, a number of different things kind of lumped into that bucket there. I heard, uh, I heard our associate superintendent yelling out there, say, um, Newsville, too. What grade? Are we adding one more grade, eighth grade? Almost square foot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a feeder school. Okay. 
It'd be a nice school, though. <laughs> uh, next slide. Uh, so this is just kind of showing us where we're at in the process and we're making our way. Um, so April is going to be, um, and we don't have it listed there, but uh, there's going to be four to six uh, work sessions uh, at the county uh, for the Education and Cultural Committee. Um, we don't have the hearing dates yet, but they're going to be uh, probably first or second week in April too. So um, we're saying April, May, but most of that's going to be, uh, most of the hearings and work sessions will be throughout April. Um, and then May 23rd, the county council is going to vote. Um, so we're mentioning county council. So, you know, this still has to go to county council. So um, uh, we, we still want to advocate for our whole budget because we still know that these are our needs, as, as we mentioned. You know, um, even though the county executive's budget didn't address inflation or didn't address the health care increase, uh, we know that these are needs of the system. So uh, the final decision is going to be the county council in May. And that, I think that's on us. We have to be very, very crystal clear mm -hmm. about what these dollars mm -hmm. are needed for. And if we don't get these dollars, what next? Yep. I mean, that's our job. We don't always do the best job, as people tell us all the time about <laughs> tell the story. Right. And so we got to tell the story. Because it, it's not, I mean, Big budgets look complicated, lots of numbers, lots of, you know, variances and this and that and the other. But what does it mean when it comes to how you're operating the school system? So, yes, that is and what's different this year from last year. We have time to tell that story. Last year, because of that, uh, the county executives proposed tax increases. We kind of went along till end of May, and then we found out we had to cut $80 million. So I think it is very important that we kind of tell the story over these next few months of what these needs are for our students. So. All right, anything else before we move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the spending affordability guidelines? Another sexy topic. Yeah, I'm going to invite uh, our executive director of finance, uh, Mr. Tom Klausing, who um, knows spending affordability inside and out. Yep, and just for the uninitiated, this is a, the spending affordability guidelines. This is a conversation we have every every year, right about now, so. Good morning, board members. Uh, if we could go to the next page and the PowerPoint. So according to the county code, any agency requesting more funding in its operating budget than the county council's spending affordability guidelines allocation must submit by March 31st a prioritized list of expenditures, how that agency would reduce its budget request to that spending affordability guideline allocation. So that's why we're here today. Actually, yesterday in the board meeting on the consent calendar was um, an item that authorized the, super, the interim superintendent to send this letter to the county council by March 31st. Typically, this fiscal management committee meeting occurs before the board meeting in March, but it's one day later, and so that's why we're a little bit uh, backwards. I was, okay, I, was, I appreciate knowing that, but um, since we did agree on that contract uh, or the resolution yesterday, um, how are they planning on notifying the board? I mean, we've gotten information about possible things, but are we going to be able to see what's being sent to the county executive and county council um, before it goes? Yes. And, and uh, just to get to the cut to the chase of this presentation, that letter will not identify specific reductions. We oh. haven't identified specific reductions for the last seven or eight years. Uh, and let me just go further and explain that and why we do what we do. So uh, next slide, please. There you go. Each year, so the county sets an aggregate spending affordability guideline ceiling in January or February for each of the four county agencies. And let me remind you what those four county agencies are. They're MCPS, Montgomery College, uh, Montgomery County Government and the National Capital Park and Planning Commission. 
So the SAG allocations are set for the four agencies in, in the county and also the real property tax ceiling for the next budget year. So the SAG allocation for us is basically what, what is the ceiling for our tax supported budget, which excludes restricted grants and our enterprise funds. And I know Mr. Riley will be talking to you more about our enterprise funds later and also our small special revenue fund. And here's something really important to keep in mind is that the SAG allocation for MCPS and for Montgomery County is based on our maintenance of effort level. So, so when the county sets the SAG allocations for each of the agencies for MCPS specifically, they set it at our maintenance of effort level, not above maintenance of effort. And it also assumes no change in the, in the uh, aid we get from the state government. When the county does this uh, spending affordability um, allocation process, the county hasn't, we haven't learned what the uh, governor's budget is going to be for MCPS. So they don't know what to include for um, state aid uh, change in FY25. Tom, I'm sorry, can I just add to, so just so everyone is clear, um, when we talk about maintenance of effort, um, you know, that's a law that says that the local government can't fund the school system at a lower level than the previous year, but it does not take into consideration any increases in salaries or benefits. It does not take into consideration um, inflation um, and so, or new school space or any of these things uh, other than enrollment. And so that's basically what our budget is made up of this year. It's uh, the salaries and benefits for our employees, it's inflation, and it's addressing increases in student population. Um, that's basically it. And so there's a, a significant gap between uh, what I think people perceive maintenance of effort to be and what it actually is. There would be really significant cuts if we were funded at maintenance of effort. Yeah. And just, you know, for the uninitiated, M Maryland has funded schools on a per pupil basis and the maintenance of effort, maintain your effort of per pupil funding year to year. So really from the state's perspective, the size of your budget goes up and down based on your enrollment. None of the other factors that, that Mr. Hall was just talking about. And you know, there's a lot of reasons that we fund on a per pupil basis. And in some ways it's good, you know, in Maryland we are fortunate because those formulas are non-negotiable. You know, the state constitution says General Assembly, Governor, you got two jobs, you got to pass a balanced budget every year, you got to fund schools. So we're fortunate. You know, you can't get out of funding schools in Maryland, but um, it's not a nimble tool either. <clears throat> so if we can go to the next slide, please. So it's important to, to recognize that the SAG allocations that we get from our county council are considered illustrative and not final. Um, the final budget that we get will be the result of the budget process that takes place now that the county executive has made his recommendations to the county council. And so we'll learn that uh, amount uh, on May 23rd, like Mr. Riley mentioned earlier. And then uh, a recent change in this county code does allow when we do this spending affordability guidelines process and look at the numbers, we are allowed to add the, um, the change in state aid. Again, that's that $38 million that Mr. Hall was mentioning earlier. Um, we get to add that into this analysis of the spending affordability guideline allocation, and I'll show that to you in a table shortly. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So the council, and I remember this from last year, one of you uh, asked about the options that the county considered, and so we spelled it out here in this, this slide of the PowerPoint. The council, in setting the SAG allocation, uh, looked at four options. One was setting it for FY25 at the FY24 level, basically no change. The second option was based on the rate of inflation and they used 2.99% as an increase in the SAG based on that. The third option was based on the average personal income change for FY for calendar year 20, 
23, and that was 3.09%. So an increase of 3.09% over the 24 number. And then the last of the four options was based on the estimated increase in the employment cost index for state and local governments for 2023. And that is four, I'm sorry, three, uh, 4.8%. So in considering those four options, the county council decided to go with option three, the average personal income uh, change of 3.09%. And so what does that mean? So they set the total aggregate operating budget at an increase of 3.09%, and that's about $300 million for the county. So. They had $300 million then to allocate to the four agencies. Well, um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll uh, give you a detail specifically for us. So remember I said that they set the, the allocation for us at maintenance of effort. Uh, they set it for the college at maintenance of effort. Well, um, the SAG allocation for us was approved at Two, I'll say $2.936 billion. Um, I know it says $2,000 million, but let me just say $2.936 or $2.937 billion. Our tax-supported budget request that the board tentatively adopted on February 22nd was $3.132 billion. So that's a difference of $195 million. So because of that change in state aid of $38.1 million, the difference between their allocation and what the board had tentatively adopted was $157.2 million. So again, keep in mind that the $300 million increase in the aggregate for the county included an increase for um, county government of $9.2 um, I don't have the exact percent, above 9%. So their SAG allocation increased by 9%. For National Capital Park and Planning Commission, it also increased by 9% because they traditionally set the allocations for us in the college at maintenance of effort. No increase above maintenance of effort. So uh, is this a fair process? I would question that uh, in the way it, it uh, is approached. They do include an increase for debt service, and I know Mr. Mr. Adams uh, is certainly interested, as we all are, uh, in what the county does on debt service as it relates to our capital budget. Um, so there's an increase of about $15 million in debt service in these SAG allocations. So um, that's basically where the numbers stand on our SAG allocation. So if we go to the next slide, um, I think it goes without saying that a reduction of $157 million in our budget would require substantial changes in that, in that budget request. And so the letter will say to the council on March 31st that any reductions would be detrimental to, to our students and our um, teaching and learning in our schools. So that's the presentation for you on spending affordability guidelines. Actually, this is a question because we're talking about um, inflation um, costs. I actually want to go back to Mr. Riley. In our budget, we have a $20.5 million uh, line item for inflation rate changes, realignment, and other adjustments, right? So can you tell me what is the rate of inflation that you or uh, we use uh, to calculate the amount of money in that line item? Yeah, that's a good question. And that it, it's going to vary depending on, you know, what services we're, uh, <laughs> we're buying. So that, that the inflation factor gets developed when we work with each of the different divisions and departments when we're doing their, uh, we call it same service budget. So they're the ones uh, going out, getting estimates on continuing services, 
you know, what it's going to cost. So, you know, it could range anywhere, you know, 3 percent, 7 or 8 percent. Uh, I know some of that uh, is, is our non-public placements. That, that rate has increased tremendously as well, too. So I couldn't give you an exact number because it's really not uh, a general estimate we make at the central office level. It's something that, um, you know, at the detail level, each of the um, directors looking at their individual budgets are, are making. And in budget, we, we do confirm and verify. You know, we ask for, you know, you got an estimate, show us that estimate. So. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about the SAG? The, um, this, um, Mr. Um, um, for the SAG, the, so $3 million for the county to spread between four agencies. $300 million, yes. $300 million. So has it always been the uh, MCPS and MC is maintenance of effort and the other is 9%? That, I, ha, that has been the practice consistently. Well, since I've been here, the 12 years uh, I've mm. I, um, worked on this spending affordability guidelines mm. process. Mm. The council has always set the college and MCPS at that maintenance of effort level. Mm -hmm. So whatever increase mm -hmm. that remains is then distributed between debt service, the county government, and the National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Carlson. Any other questions about the spending affordability guidelines? I don't think so. All right. Thank you. It's in the weeds work that is absolutely essential. Now, next item on our agenda is uh, capital improvements program, so our capital budget. Lots of fun stuff happening there. Good morning, and certainly a good segue into the, the capital budget with spending affordability, because that certainly is um, a, a driving force behind, you know, as Mr. Clausing said, debt service and the ability of the county to, to fund the, the board's request. Um, so just to give... For the uninitiated, introduce yourself. Oh, yes. So Seth Adams, uh, Associate Superintendent, uh, Office of Facilities Management. Um, so just to recap and where we've been with the capital budget, obviously, um, I think we've talked before, the, the Board of Education requested a $1.999 billion uh, request. Um, the county executive's uh, recommended budget reduced that by um, $91 million. Uh, but the nuance of the county executive's reduction was a 346 .2 million dollar reduction in the first four years of our CIP with the additional funding in the fifth and sixth year. Um, and why that's important is because, again, the CIP is funded over a six-year period uh, and, you know, our construction projects, you know, are individual line items, uh, but their expenditures, meaning sort of how much money is spent on those projects is, is, is is um, spread over those six years. So, uh, for example, a project um, like Northwood that we're, that we're ready to start, they will have expenditures this year, next year, um, FY 2026, and even some in FY 27. So a reduction of $346 million in those first four years really just translates into delays of projects by multiple years or removal altogether. Um, so as part of the process, the county, uh, the county council, um, education and culture committee has, has, has been working with us over the past several work sessions on what non-recommended reductions would look like. Again, those non-recommended reductions are to uh, uh, a request of us, uh, MCPS, to um, provide the ability or solutions to meet the county executive's budget usually solutions that don't align well with the board's request, but solutions that obviously have to fit within the fiscal uh, climate of the county. So part of the process this year was, again, to, to provide two scenarios. Um, one scenario, uh, A, is um, one that, that does focus more on our systemic projects, uh, roofing, uh, HVAC, our, our planned life cycle asset replacement, you know, our building modification program improvement. And, and what that translated into is adding more money to those programs over the, uh, the, 
the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth year of the CIP to the tune of $250 million for those projects. Um, in order to, by adding $250 million in those systemic um, countywide projects, it means projects were removed from the CIP, predominantly um, Wooten and Magruder, and then expenditure dollars of Damascus and even Eastern that were pushed out of the CIP. Um, it doesn't mean that those projects necessarily were gone. Um, it just means that expenditures were pushed out and completion dates turned to two, to be determined. Um, and in the case of Wooten and Magruder, uh, while planning dollars were still there, all construction dollars were removed from, from the CIP. Um, so as part of the, the, uh, the process, again, the scenario two was one that was more traditional, I, I would say, in terms of what non-recommended reductions would look like. It kept all projects still within the CIP, so meaning Wooten and Magruder stayed. They had construction dollars that stayed in the CIP, but everything was shifted out. There were significant reductions um, in, you know, again, those first four years. So uh, we had major delays in everything from Burtonsville to Joanne Lellick. Um, you know, we, we pushed uh, the early education uh, expenditures out. So there was a variety of things to try to keep everything in, but it just basically delayed everything. Um, through the education and culture conversations, there, there's definitely energy around option A. Option A being um, one that, that I would say it, does, it, it doesn't level the CIP out, but it does, it adds money to those countywides. Uh, adds significant dollars to those countywides um, over the, the last four years of the CIP. Uh, and, and what we've heard from the Education and Culture Committee is that this, they would like us to um, focus on those programs and even take a step back and look at the, the schools that we've identified, the, even the four elementaries that were identified as, as being uh, part of the major capital program, Cold Spring, Damascus, Whetstone, and Twinbrook, and see if there's ways to use dollars around systemics, roofing, infrastructure, PILAR, uh, to either help them get to the, to the point of where their building will be approached or um, offset altogether the, uh, the, the idea of um, doing a teardown and replacement. So they've asked us to do some of those assessments and, and come back with, with scenarios that what that might look like. And, and certainly we're well prepared to do that um, over the course of, of the next several months to years. But, but that's, that's an update um, on where we are. We have one more education and culture committee meeting Thursday. Um, the intent of that is again, just to do one last look at where we are. Um, the the uh, education and culture committee has, uh, has has really aligned themselves with with recommending option A, with the exception of they would look for, they're looking for opportunities to accelerate Eastern Middle School, um, based on the the delay that was associated with that project. In addition to Thursday, they will be reviewing the county executives amended CIP. Uh, the county executives um, amended CIP that came out on March 14th um, basically did a couple things. Uh, it, it's, it further reduced the first two years of the CIP by $2 million in each year, and that's because of um, lower than anticipated recordation tax. Uh, but what it did also is add money to the last two years of the CIP um, and it's being defined as the building towards a structurally balanced CIP for MCPS. So it adds um, about $17 million in the last two years. Uh, and based on the county council's, uh, county council staff, the, the, it's, not, it's not assigned to any individual project. So uh, how they view this is it will certainly be considered as part of reconciliation, but it's not necessarily apply to any individual project or it's not necessarily going to benefit any individual project that we put forth as part of the, the board's uh, capital improvements program. And just just <clears throat> kind of briefly share when the, the, the county executive's comment around a structurally uh, balanced CIP, one of the criticisms that has come forward from him and his budget staff is that every time you look at an, a six-year CIP for MCPS, the funding is front-loaded in the early years. And from our perspective, there's a reason for that because we have, we have we actually have projects and work that is happening in those early years, but um, it gets to the fact that we we do budget 
capital dollars in six-year cycles. Not that they're not adjusted in and out of there all the time, but um, just explain a little bit about what the county executive meant by structurally balanced and what he was, he and team were looking at when they made that comment about the way we budget our capital. Sure, and I, and I think uh, various um, groups or entities may have different perspectives of what front-loaded CIP may mean. Um, for the county executive and working with Office of Management and Budget, um, the, the challenge for them uh, that they've seen is that uh, the first several years of our CIP historically have had the most um, money, the most expenditure dollars in it, because that's where the construction projects are. Um, and historically, we have not identified or we haven't programmed projects to necessarily start construction in the, f the fifth or sixth year. Um, we're still working through scopes. We're still defining. We've, we've, we've had placeholders. You know, again, trying to make sure as a whole CIP, you know, that number usually doesn't change. You know, so the, the, the goal for us has been to focus that attention on the construction projects in the first couple of years, and then in the last few years have, have more planning, have, have more some, some placeholder types of dollars, but not put money in the out years for things we just don't know, right? I mean, the idea is not to put money in the out years for a placeholder. The, the idea around a structurally balanced, non-front-loaded CIP, I would say, is that it's going to add more money in the out years for our systemic projects, our countywide projects. Um, we won't necessarily still have projects identified for those, but it will be placeholders for those projects. Um, and, and what that means is it, it just means, I, I think, as we move forward, less, uh, less of our big individual projects. And, and we've talked about this at the county, at the education and culture, you know, really the idea of having more money associated with our, our infrastructure challenges and less money to big capacity projects um, is likely the only way to get to the goal of having a, a CIP that has expenditures consistent from year one all the way to year six. Um, so that's that's something we'll work through. I, I think the other part of it, and, and I'm not sure, and we will certainly have more conversations about what this structurally balanced CIP, but more placeholder dollars in FY29 and 30 um, would allow us to um, have them sort of be as placeholders, and as we identify projects, maybe next year or the year beyond, it's, it's placeholder money that's preserved for us, um, which is certainly a positive, but at the same time, I think as we go through reconciliation, it's, it's going to be really challenging for the county council to hold a big dollar amount in the out years for us, just, just in case versus fund projects in transportation or libraries or others. So we, we will certainly, you know, I, I think um, we're supportive of this approach. Obviously, we put forward a, a uh, non-recommended reduction that would allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. I think, though, um, you know, we won't know if this is, is something that will be favorable to MCPS until another four years, uh, five years. And when we get to the point where those placeholders are either there or continue to be there or, or they're not. So that's something that obviously we'll, we'll have to continue to work with OMB um, and our partners at the County Council and the County Executive as, as we move forward with this approach. Mr. Ad, um, Mr. Adams, can you share with us typically the MCPS CIP? What percentage is MCPS CIP? in terms of the county-wide CIP budget? So, so um, and that's a great question. Um, historically, you know, and, and the CIP is broken down from a county perspective of, of bond dollars, uh, you know, state aid, and then recordation tax, impact tax. Uh, if you remember from our first presentations, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Karamia showed us those sort of pie graphs. Mm -hmm. but, but how we really compare it to the rest of the county agencies is, is the bond dollars. You know, where, where do we compare to the bond dollars that are, that are allocated to, let's say, um, transportation and others? Historically, we have... Um, have had the largest share of bond dollars. Mm -hmm. Over the past couple of years, we have gone from the, the highest percentage of bond dollars down to the third yeah. uh, on the list, with the general government, um, DGS, and transportation being the highest agencies with bond dollars. So mm -hmm. our, our um, it has been a shift over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that shift is, is the OMB um, increasing assumptions around state aid, 
you know, so I, I think for them, you know, the CIP may look consistent, the dollar value, but the share that they're assuming is higher in state aid and less in bonds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I don't necessarily think those assumptions are, are going to work out, you know, uh, you know, in all cases, they may in some, but the reality is, is once you allocate those bond dollars to other agencies, mm -hmm. those bond dollars aren't coming back to us. So, so again, I think, you know, we've, we've had uh, different approaches to our CIP over the years. Um, and, and one would argue that the front-loaded approach is one that makes sure that we, we uh, continue forward with our construction and allow room for other agencies to obviously continue to do what the, they're doing. But as we move through this process, with us, um, with the, the, the shift in where the bond dollars lie with different agencies, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty much going to be a fixed um, position over the next six years as, as we move forward. So... Um, I think given that situation, right, so then I think our community hasn't caught on this change of how we do the CIP uh, budget and how we are being allocated with the money. So I, I, I see the need of, uh, of communicating with our community this, right? I think if we sit here and talk about it, but uh, students, families, community members are still hoping to see big projects being done. Yeah. And that is the reality and expectation not matching, right? Uh, so how we can communicate and figure out within this a lot of money or, or uh, you know, why we continue to advocate for uh, funding, increased funding, but within this pie, how we can still move project along the way and different approach might be really important to communicate and dialogue with stakeholders of our buildings. It, yeah. it certainly will. I, I, mm -hmm. I would say part of the transition to our major capital project program away from the revitalization expansion program a few years ago was to you know really have a um, a very specific view of every project and, and try to make the best fiscal decision um, for, for each one. And, and that would mean partial renovation, maybe partial expansion, maybe all renovation. Um, what we've found as we've gone through that, and the Poolsville High School was the first project to go through this, um, our communities expect what the last school received, right? So we heard as we talked about, you know, renovation work at Poolsville, if we talk about renovation work even at Damascus, the response is, well, that's not what Seneca Valley got. That's not what, you know, Paint Branch or Gaithersburg got. Um, so you're right. The expectation setting moving forward is going to be important. We actually had conversations at the last Education and Culture Committee about this exact topic that, you know, when you change the expectations sort of this significantly, um, it's going to take all political bodies um, to be a part of, of that conversation um, and reset of expectations moving forward. And I think we've we've all experienced um, when we when we change the scope a little bit to be a little different than what we are accustomed to. We have a very specific strong reaction from our from our communities and one that we're going to obviously have to continue to manage over the foreseeable future based on this this new capital improvements program approach. Yeah, I was going to say. As far as talking to the communities, we'll hear from the ones that, that uh, the, the, where there are changes. Yeah. So. But I think, though, I think our communities, um, uh, like, I think if we communicate, I think they can understand a lot and can come along with us. So I think, uh, you know, our effort in, in um, educating the communities, right, really don't be afraid of showing the numbers, all the shift in the funding patterns, and, and say that it's, just, it's just not, you know, it will be different from before, but we'll, we'll still have work done in phases and by different steps. I think, uh, uh, you know, it is harder to communicate this way, but I think it's very worthwhile given the situation we are in. Yeah, I, and I would just echo that. I think there there are tremendous um, there's a tremendous payoff when you communicate early and often with community. Um, and we've been saying since I got on the board, since I got on this committee on the first day, <laughs> of, they joined the board of education. Um, no surprise, this is our goal. And I think we've gotten a lot better, but 
we're not there yet because I do think like some of the changes we've had to make recently looking at our fiscal realities around Woodward and how that's going to impact Northwood you know w they really felt like that they weren't they weren't done the courtesy of having those conversations as we were seeing the landscape shift and we didn't we really do need to be really proactive and not be afraid of that I mean because that's the reality I mean we can't make money we don't have a press in the basement if we did we get arrested so you know it's just it is what it is and I think when we look at the both budgets but in particular the capital budget the cost increases we've seen are unprecedented inflationary pressures labor cost increases supply chain disruptions unprecedented and when we look at and, and a lot of our big ticket items, even now that they're even bigger ticket items, are ones that people don't see. And we had this conversation um, a while back about the um, um, the uh, Watkins Mill High School HVAC replacement, which is a huge project, mm -hmm. many, 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 many millions of dollars phased in over time, many procurement items around that. Nobody sees it. It's not like you walk in the building and, well, oh, what a beautiful new HVAC system. <laughs> but it's millions and millions and millions of dollars that goes mm -hmm. to how are we creating healthy and, and, and you know, spaces for our, our staff and our community and our students to inhabit. Mm -hmm. And so part of, I think, that, that no no surprises messaging is being really transparent about where the money's going and and it's not going as far because we've we've had this conversation too expectation setting the costs for the new northwood are jaw dropping but it's not because that's going to be the Taj Mahal. Right. It's going to be a nice school, like because we build nice schools. But it's going to cost that much just because that's how much it's going to cost. Um, not because we're doing something different or we're doing something more, or it's just the it. And we have to. That's the message to be really, really proactive about. And people know that intuitively. They see it in their lives. And wh why should? the school system's experience and budgeting challenges be different than the ones they experience in their own lives every day. But we, we have to tell the story. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and not be afraid to. Even like with the operating budget, you know, people don't even take into consideration the change in gas prices right? and things like that. So Food prices. You know, right. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's where we are um, in terms of that process. We once the uh, once we have our meeting uh, Thursday with Education and Culture, they will take their full recommendation to the full council, and then there will be council uh, council discussion um, moving forward into the reconciliation process. So we'll we'll certainly keep everyone up to speed. Um, the last piece that I did just want to touch upon, and this this came up um, at uh, our public hearing, was around our our real estate approach, um, again, that falls within our capital improvements program. And this is a, a good um, sort of segue balancing point between uh, the operating budget and that of the capital budget. Um, we have uh, 20 closed schools that we operate, um, which equate to 745,000 square feet um, and close to 200 acres of land. We have 16 owned sites that, that are green space that are over 235 acres. Um, so as we, as we continue down the path of um, understanding where we are as a county as a whole around, you know, from a fiscal reality, we, we are going to start to look at some of these um, properties and, and think about making the best decisions moving forward. Some of these properties, um, seven of them have leases, eight of them have uh, MCPS staff housed in them, uh, six are holding facilities. So we, we are going to have to take a step back um, and really uh, take a different look at how we're, we're managing these particular facilities um, moving forward and then see how that may impact and it, uh, help um, you know, possible solutions moving forward um, in the CIP. The, the other piece to um, the CIP is that, you know, we will start uh, we very near future, and you'll likely see this coming at a future full board meeting, is starting to look at are there opportunities to take advantage of um, public-private partnerships, uh, P3. Uh, I know Prince George's County is, is going through that process with, with um, 
several other schools. Uh, we've been working with the county executive around is there an opportunity in Montgomery to, to do that type of work? Um, and there may be, but we, we certainly will explore that to see if we can leverage um, you know, that as an opportunity to, to, to be able to do more with, with what we have um, and with the needs that we have. So I, I say that because um, you know, we ha we've had some tough conversations around the CIP, uh, and I just want to assure you as, as the you know, Fiscal Management Committee that we are exploring a variety of other opportunities uh, to make sure we can continue the progress forward uh, with, with delivering high-quality educational environments to our students. Yeah, and I really do appreciate that because, you know, the properties in our portfolio that really aren't under our use, we still are, there's a huge amount of our maintenance and operations budget goes there because we're still like the landlords and we have to do the maintenance and we have to do the upkeep and we have to, you know, we have to keep the acreage mode or, you know, maintained. And, um, and if you look countywide at our capacity, we have a lot of under capacity, a lot of under capacity at elementary schools. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the projections, the enrollment projections going forward, they're still going to be under capacity. So, you know, our need for hold six holding schools, for instance, mm -hmm. um, really having that, you know, really objective conversation about do we need, you know, looking at our needs long term, our, you know, where we're going enrollment wise, do we do we need six holding schools? You know, you know, really having that conversation in a, in kind of a fearless, open-minded way, I think, is important because, you know, we need to right-size. I think everything that we're doing. Mr. Lockman has something. I was just going to ask Mr. Adams if there's a, a like a quick and easy list of the the inactive uh, facilities that you were you were listing off some some specifics. If there's an easy way to just connect us with the specifics. Yeah, I was say, I'd love to see that. that yeah. There's usually an appendix in the CIP book. Yep, it's appendix. It is, okay. Appendix I. In the Perfect, thank you. Oh, look. Which one? Appendix I. Appendix I. Appendix. One of my favorite books, by the way. Yeah, and I love all the appendices. That's where the, that's where the sauce is, you know, in this book. Appendices are amazing. Okay, um, any other questions for my colleagues? All right. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Challenging times. We will continue to... Stay on it, though. And again, but again, you know, just, I don't, people complain about Montgomery County Public Schools until they go somewhere else, you know, until mm -hmm. they experience another system. And then they're like, hmm, wow, you guys do a lot. So I really do appreciate the work and the way that we, we try very, very hard to do all of the work that, and a lot of it is, you know, it's like, the iceberg that sank the Titanic. Only this much of what the work of the school system is visible to the public, really. So much of it is under the system, and it goes to managing and operations efficiently and effectively so that we can have operational excellence and be good stewards of the money that, you know, and so I really do appreciate the work to just be very pragmatic about this because, you know, that's kind of where we are. That's I mean, right. sometimes we can be aspirational, sometimes we have to be pragmatic, and we're at a pragmatic place right now, so. Um, yeah. Thank you. And next thing on our agenda, one of my favorite things we get to talk about is sustainability. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Um, so my name is Lynn Sarate. I'm the director of the Division of Sustainability and Compliance from Montgomery County Schools. And today we have a slide presentation to talk about our greenhouse gas emissions over the past 20 or so years and where we are today and then where we're going to get where we need to go as we set out in our sustainability policy a couple of years ago. Yeah. Which, the first by the way, if greenhouse gas emissions are our biggest climate impact, and it's, our, it's not unique to us. I mean, everywhere you go, county. And so if the county is going to meet right. its climate action goals, we have to meet ours. And it's, it's an almost, I mean, a whole huge percentage of that is what you're going to talk about right now. Yes. Absolutely. She didn't want you to underplay it. Yeah, don't <laughs> underplay it. This is important. Yeah. Our students, as we talked about in our policy, our students are the citizens of the future. And we're building that framework for them moving forward. Can I have the first slide, please? Next slide, please. 
Okay, so that's the policy that MCPS actually, um, the board had passed unanimously in 2020, and we committed to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2027, that's just a couple years from now, and 100% by 2035 compared to our 2005 levels. Um, we also said that we were going to intentionally, equitably, and progressively reduce our environmental impacts and costs and we were gonna take a comprehensive approach to sustainability. So that's what this report was about, is really taking a look at the whole system. Um, and I wanna give a shout out to my staff member, Richard Benjamin, who's the leader of our CERT team, who actually led a lot of this study. So um, he did a lot of legwork on this because there's very complicated formulas with EPA um, and also aligning to what the county measurement tools that the county's using, because we didn't wanna measure it one way, have the county measured another way, have the region of governments measured another way, we all align to the same measurement parameters. Um, but the other thing that's significant about this policy is that we talked about humans are making these environmental changes. And so this policy is about what are the humans going to do to, to fix it? Um, we have to protect and sustain and reduce our environmental impact and demonstrate a responsible use of our public funds while we mitigate the effects of climate change. So next slide, please. So our strategies do align with the county's 2021 action, climate action plan, which sets the same exact goals. That climate action plan also has targets in it for MCPS to attain 50% um, of our green schools in theory by this year, but because of COVID, the state has allowed an adjustment of that by a couple of years. So um, we're getting close, we're not quite there, but we're getting very close to that 50%, but certainly 50% is not where the 100 is that we wanna also get to by 2035. It's interesting to note that um, the Regional Council of Governments, which is basically the, the metropolitan areas around DC, um, that's the Council of Governments, they actually published a priority climate action plan early last month. And the reason they did that work was to align with some of the Infra Infrastructure Reduction Act funding and the Climate Pollution Reduction Fund grants that are out there. Um, they have to be done at a regional level. And so we are working with our county partners to hopefully get some projects for MCPS within those projects. But they're really looking at things that are gonna have that regional impact. The Council of Government goals are more conservative than Montgomery County, Montgomery County Public Schools goals. They more reflect what um, the state goals are, a slower timeline, um, but they are going to be updating their action plan by 2025. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Um, the other thing to note about these uh, climate pollution reduction grant funds is that they target disadvantaged census block groups. And within Montgomery County, we do have several of those disadvantaged sensitive block groups. So that makes us higher priority to be able to get some of that funding. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the past. This is looking at the past. We're starting in 2005 because that's where everybody's benchmark year is. In fiscal 2005, we emitted just about 169,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Um, we, we made a couple reductions, we went up, and then we came down. That big dip that you see in fiscal 21 is that word that we shall not say again. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just move on from there. Um, but you do see the dramatic um, reduction in di diesel as the buses weren't on the road. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how we can change things, but it also is interesting to see how, you know, having to still maintain ventilation in our buildings, we didn't have a lot of energy savings because we, we needed to save, we needed to keep that in there for the workers that were there doing work. And we also, um, we saw electricity go down a little bit, but the heating of the buildings could not go down, right? Because we didn't want the pipes to freeze. Um, we are the largest local agency consumer of electricity in the county. Next slide, please. Oh, can we actually slip to, skip to the, Slide six, it's a pie graph, which is a better next slide. Thank you. Okay, so the three largest sources of emissions in Montgomery County schools are electricity, which is more than 50%, our diesel use, which is used both by the buses primarily, but also by some fleet vehicles, um, for example, maintenance, some of those heavy equipment need to use um, diesel. And then our buildings use natural gas to heat, many of them do that. Um, the great, great, great environmental news is that we only have a fuel oil tank left at one site. That one site is a remote site. Um, we have done this strategically over the past several years. For many, many, many years, we had uh, fuel oil at our high schools as a backup for the natural gas because of the, the, the problems with um, getting the natural gas supplies over the years. Those have def pretty much resolved at this point, and the tanks are more of a, a 
liability for us to have them. Um, the one the one school that has a fuel oil tank, we we were really trying really hard to see how we could do an HVAC project and actually get rid of that fuel oil tank. Um, we can get rid of the fuel oil tank, but we cannot completely electrify it because of the remote location. They do not have enough electric service into that area. It's mm. monocacy, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so we will be putting propane at that school, which is a much cleaner fuel, so it's better for the environment. Um, but we will still have that situation in, in many of our locations. Monocacy is actually the second site that we looked at for electrification, for full electrification, but we didn't have that grid capacity coming into the neighborhood. And so that's actually a conversation we've started to have with some of our county and regional partners that, you know, we, we're, we're trying to figure this out, but we, we're, we're hitting a roadblock that we can't solve. Um, but it's part of that whole, you know, let's talk about it and let's figure out how we're going to solve these problems. Okay, now if you can go back one slide, please. Okay. Um, no, back. I'm sorry. It's a bar graph. Slide five. MH, uh, GHG emissions grade, it's um, green and blue. Slide five. Slide five. Right? Try slide five. One more. There we go. Okay. So. The reason I wanted to switch the order was because the other one showed a big picture of where the stuff came from, and then this shows how did we achieve those reductions. And the really significant thing about this is that our electricity purchases became cleaner because we intentionally, voluntarily purchased clean energy as part of our electricity purchases. But we also had our students in our buildings leading the effort to reduce consumption. And that's a big jump right there for them to, to achieve that. Um, you can see that reducing consumption is actually really happening because we see that also happening in the natural gas one, right? Mm -hmm. And um, fuel oil went away because we got rid of the fuel oil tanks. Um, most of the propane that we have around, um, it, it, on the graph it just doesn't show up much. Um, it's more, it's, that's things like, um, except for the heating situation that we're talking about, it's more like emergency generators and science use. We're not going to see a lot of reduction in propane, but that's okay because there's not a lot of use of it. Our big, big area to reduce is electricity and we'll remain that moving forward second one is is the diesel and the third one is the natural gas next slide not the pie graph one next one perfect okay so this shows the future if we do nothing beyond what we've got planned right now um, the grid will actually get cleaner by itself. There's a Maryland Renewable Portfolio Standard that requires the grid to actually become cleaner. So right now, the electricity that we purchase, some percentage of it comes from coal, which is one of the dirtiest fuels. Um, some percentage of it comes from renewable sources. Some of it comes from natural gas. So over the next several years, and, and by, I think, 2050, Maryland's grid becomes completely clean. But again, our timeline is 2035. So the do-nothing approach isn't going to get us to our goals. We have to do something. Um, that's electricity. The other two lines that are significant on here again are the natural gas, which is the blue, and the orange, which is the diesel. We've got to do something. Um, you'll see that um, you can start to see where we've got the electric buses coming in and making that little bit of a dip that's starting um, between fiscal 22 and 23, um, and th that's that reason for that dip up there. Um, the other two that are smaller and you don't see too much on this graph, um, again, is propane and the gasoline for the staff vehicles. It's there. It's definitely there. And it's definitely something um, we have actions we're taking moving forward. Um, but we, we do have to take more actions than do nothing. So next slide. The good news about this is that um, with this do nothing scenario, we assume that we would still have growth of our buildings. We assumed that we would still have growth in the number of vehicles that we needed, um, and we assumed we were going to have to continue that propane and the backup generators and the natural gas. Um, but the, the good thing about the scenario is when you look at the regional scenario, because of the growth that's expected in the region, the region's scenario does not look like that graph. The region's scenario goes up by almost 38 percent in the future. And so, you know, our actions that we're taking Although I'm calling them do-nothing, they aren't completely do-nothing. They are controlling it. They're just not eliminating it like our target is. Next slide, please. Okay, so getting to zero, picture's worth a thousand words. We've already got lots of stuff in place. 
Um, I'm so proud of our electric vehicles that we have um, in our, for our team. We have a contest that ended a couple days ago for the students to design artwork, and we're going to wrap those vehicles um, next fiscal year um, with that student artwork to really promote what we're doing here. I was actually behind an electric school bus for the first time the other day, and I got distracted because <laughs> I was like, look, I see the little, the little sign on them. We can't do a lot with our buses because of state safety regulations, but we can certainly do a lot with our vans, and so look for those in the fall. Yeah, the students were really keen to design something to put on our diesel buses to like so people knew, so they could we could really celebrate what we we're doing to electrify, because really, students will say, oh, we never have electric buses, or we never have an electric bus, I've never seen one. I'm like, well, how would you know? <laughs> I mean, the way you know is, A, they don't make any noise, and B, they don't smell. Right. Mm -hmm. And other than that, they pretty much look like a bus. So mm -hmm. they wanted to, and as you said, state law says. But we'll, this will be really, really cool. Yeah. Hopefully we'll get enough designs to have several different versions yeah. out there. So. On the bus, that, on, the, on our other fleet, because we do have other fleet yep. vehicles. Yeah. Yep. OK, next slide, please. Okay, so what actions are we going to take to reduce our emissions? This shows the model scenario of how we get to zero at 2035. It's going to take significant investment, um, significant external grants, and significant federal tax credits. Um, but th this at least is kind of what we need to do to go forward. So the orange again shows that CO2 emissions. We're, not, we're looking at emissions now instead of um, actual use of consumption of a commodity. Um, and so. The, the goal is to, to gradually reduce those emissions over the next several years in the orange. The easiest, but potentially very expensive, is the gold that's shown at the top. That's purchasing the wrecks, right? We can just go out on the market and buy clean energy, just like you can at home. You can say, I want to buy solar at home. We can do the same thing with MCPS. And we've been doing that to some to some extent. Um, but one, one of the strategies moving forward will have to continue to be to buy some of that clean energy. The next two that you can see is that green, again, we talked about the fleet vehicles, the, the bright green is the fleet vehicles, and then the, um, let's see, what was the, the, I'm sorry, the green is, is the yellow is the, the fleet vehicles. The green are the net zero buildings. So the net zero buildings, they're a small contribution, partially because of the conversation um, that was just had, that we're, we're not doing quite as much brand new building construction moving forward, but also due to the fact that when we're building those new buildings, because of the policy now, we are deliberately making those buildings consume less energy, right? In the past, when we built a new building, energy savings wasn't necessarily a primary focus. It was like, let's get the building built, let's have it wonderful, but energy savings, if it happened, it happened. Now we're really deliberately focusing on, I want this as low as it can be, and we want it to be net zero. We'll talk about that a little bit um, in the future slides. Um, in the brown or the red slide, you will see, um, our school buses and the actions that have to continue there to be able to recover those greenhouse gas emissions. And the last one, which is the most technologically difficult, probably will be that decarbonization of our existing buildings, being able to electrify the buildings, get rid of the natural gas. It's not as simple as a homeowner modification. Homeowners, you've probably got both lines coming in, but you, you probably have enough electric capacity in your building because it's not such a mega commercial building. Um, you also don't have the, the ventilation systems in your house that are as complicated and you don't necessarily have as much work to do to make your building be able to have the capacity that our buildings have, electric capacity. So it is significantly more complicated to electrify a commercial building. So that's going to be, that's going to be the tough one for us to cover. Next slide, please. So just flipping that graph around, what are the key strategies we, we're going to do moving forward? Electrify our fleet, electrify our buildings, net zero construction goals, and actual incorporating solar on those buildings, because um, they'll be net zero ready, and then get the, the solar on them, and then purchasing the green power. Next slide. And just in light of that, I mean, I can't remember which um, meeting it was. A couple of months ago, we had an initial design presentation for the new Burtonsville Elementary School, and it was net zero. The design was net zero, it was, it was ready for solar installation on the roof, just everything that you said, the plans for that new construction, it was coming online as a net zero building, except for the fact people were going to drive to it. I'm like, you drive to it, it's not really net zero, but we're getting there. But yes, and that's the work. I mean, that we should be talking about that, you know? And it is significantly more expensive to have the geo exchange systems that are in there yeah. um, because of just the, the, the drills, that the welling the wells that have to be drilled to be able to make that, that happen. Um, but 
there are also new tax credits that we can take advantage of those to help fund those moving forward too. And so there's lots of new new legislation at the federal level that will help provide some supplemental funding for this. Um, okay, so electrifying the school bus fleet. Now, I, I do want to say that it, electrify doesn't have to necessarily be where we go in the future. Um, the county is actually installing a hydrogen fueling station um, that will be over right near the Crabs Branch bus depot. Um, and it, that is probably in the future going to be a very significant source of fuel for us moving forward, for us as a, as a planet. Um, the larger vehicles just don't do well with these giant batteries in them. Right. Um, if you think about our 18 wheelers, um, you'd have to take up half the 18 wheeler to be able to half of the storage capacity of the 18 wheeler to have enough batteries for it to be a, a truck that's going to get as far as it needs to get. And so hydrogen, there's a lot of work of going into that. Um, and I think really, given um, just some of the supply chain um, challenges that we've had too, we don't want all of the eggs in one basket, right? We want to look at hydrogen, and there's definitely got to be other technologies that will either develop or are in the incubator stage at this point. Um, and so we did leave that flexibility in the policy, we said, or other clean fuel vehicles. It didn't say only electric. Um, but at this, at the, this point, um, you know, when my staff is, we, we need to get a new vehicle, we are getting going for the, the hybrid still sometimes, um, and then the electric vehicles. Um, and also the other conversation that we're having um, is the right-sized vehicles, right? Um, there are times when you need the larger vehicle, but are there always times that you need the larger vehicle? Um, there are times that you need to drive alone, but there are other times we can carpool. It's, those are some of those cultural um, consumption shifts that are going to have to happen, and um, we're trying to model that. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of electrifying our building, <clears throat> End use. Um, one of the questions I, I received from the students, a bunch of questions the other day from the Student Climate Action Council, and I said, well, you know what? Just um, when you get home from school on Wednesday, watch the Fiscal Management Committee meeting because I actually was going to talk a lot about a lot of their questions that they had. Um, but one of the questions that they said is, you know, how does a building make greenhouse gases? And they said, does, is it coming from our heating and cooling systems? And yes, basically, that's one of the, the biggest ways that we generate the greenhouse gases in a building is because we're actually burning fuel to run those heating systems or those air conditioning systems. And as I mentioned earlier, our types of fuel have gotten cleaner. So, um, but that some, in some cases just means there's not as much particulate matter. It doesn't always mean that we've reduced our greenhouse gases. And so by going to electric, clean electric, that's really the target of, of electrifying those end uses. Um, they also asked about cafeterias. And I said, well, you know, cafeterias, while we can um, talk about looking at new types of appliances for cooking, and we're, we've, we've thought about some ways we can pilot some of those, it's really not a primary source of greenhouse gas emissions from the cooking perspective. Um, Okay, so what are we doing, right? We're looking at basically changing from natural gas systems to air source or ground source heat pump technology. So air source is just like an air source thing you would have at your house, a heat pump at your house. The ground source is that geo exchange that's underground. Um, and then the audits. We've talked extensively about this the past couple, several meetings. We finished our 50 audits. We've actually launched it. We are doing walkthroughs at some of the buildings right now. In spring break, we'll be doing some. This end of this um, year, we'll already be starting some of that work and get a whole bunch of work done this summer. We're fortunate and grateful to have some ESSER funding um, that we have to get spent this summer. Um, and we're using that to fund some of these infrastructure improvement projects, too, because we're being able to, to accomplish two goals at once. Um, and last, um, we can put the best building there, but if we don't have some kind of monitoring system to make sure that somebody's not leaving the lights on all night, um, and that those kind of different technology things, um, it won't work. If, if the behavior doesn't change, we can still not achieve our goals. So we're making sure that we've got the, the technology in there. Um, so almost every single school in the 50 will get lighting projects. So we're going to change from um, the old-fashioned fluorescent bulbs to LED light bulbs. Um, the only ones that aren't getting them are ones that just recently had a project, and they already had the LEDs. Um, and then improving our building tightness so we're not wasting um, that, uh, that heating and that cooling. And also retro commissioning. Is, uh, retro commissioning is, is so under-recognized because what? retro commissioning means going through your building and making sure the sensors are operating correctly. So if it says 76, is it really 76? Or is it 80, right? Either way, we've got a comfort problem and a heat, 
heating problem, like an energy use problem. So retro commissioning is like really fantastic to be able to go back and correct those things because that's going to improve our learning environments, right? That we've got that building working the way it was designed to work. So that's really exciting. Almost all of our buildings are getting some level of that retro commissioning too. Next slide, please. Okay, zero emissions and new construction. We just talked a little bit about Burtonsville. Um, I was actually sat down with the engineers on both Burtonsville and Leelick this week to, to look at that. Um, the devil's in the details um, and, and getting those different details worked out. And um, if needed, we will have that offsite solar that we can um, supplement any, you know, since these are our first couple, you know, we're gonna try as darn as we can, but we do have that offsite solar um, almost operational. It's actually should be operational this month. Um, but again, our deliberate focus at this point is making sure that when they're designing the buildings, they're looking at net zero already, and that we're building those buildings with that extra installation or whatever's needed to make sure that we aren't wasting energy, but at the same time, we're increasing our sustainability and resiliency. You know, most of our high schools are used as emergency shelters, and so as we talk about climate change and the need to support the communities, we need to make sure that those schools continue to be able to do that. Next slide, please. I, I will say on construction, the other thing that we, we look at um, in addition to the EUI is, you know, the cost-benefit analysis. Well, if I do this, it will have this result, but if I do this, it might cost money, but it'll have that result. So we've had several of those conversations since the policy. Um, clean energy comes from lots of things, but primarily it's from purchasing the racks and increasing our solar. Um, we're I'm spending a lot of solar, time on solar lately. Um, we should have a lot of more solar coming online this year. Um, as both part of our um, prior PPA agreement, per power purchase agreement, and our ESCO projects. And then very soon we'll be putting out a new RFP for the next batch of solar, and we'll be continuing to incorporate solar into the next 50 um, ESCO schools too. I'd like to hear that because yeah. I know Mr. Adams is probably very sick and tired of me sitting there saying, where are the solar panels? Where are the solar panels <laughs> on all of our new constructions or roofing projects? Well, and it's complicated because it has to come through operating budget, not capital budget, if it's a power purchase agreement. Mm. And so that's why it's not there the day the school opens. Oh. Um, but now with these new federal credits, um, we'll, see, we'll see what we can do to speed that up and, and consider ownership of them with a maintenance agreement. Um, we, it was not financially possible to have ownership prior to these new federal um, tax incentives. Um, oh. The other thing I wanted to say on this slide was um, our sites are very constrained. Um, we have had a lot of challenges um, in the first canopy that we're trying to design, um, but incorporating the design of that solar while we're designing a new building helps eliminate those constraints, right? We can we can build the solar around the other structures, whereas when we're trying to retrofit a solar canopy into a site, that's a little more complicated because you have a lot of underground utilities under those parking lots. So um, that's another reason to, to really think of the new construction, and, but also we've got to remember that the sites are constrained um, and you know there's only so much we can get on a site um, because there's only so much rooftop um, real estate that there is. Okay, next slide, please. So next steps, basically continue our conservation measures, continue to harness that power from the students, um, and really have them engage with their sustainability action plans at their schools. Um, get that data to them that I was talking about using the technology, making sure that they have access to that data. Um, quantify the cost of our fleet transition. I haven't talked much about that, but anybody who's going out to shop for a vehicle, it's the same thing in the commercial world. Um, but we are working with PEPCO right now for fleet assessment and some rebates on some vehicles there. Oh, the one other thing I wanted to talk about is also, every time any of us pays any kind of utility bill, there's a charge on there that's called the Empower Maryland charge. And what that is is they basically are collecting money and putting it in a pot and they save it for incentive money for people to make projects in the future that save energy. And so um, if you recall last year, we, we brought a resolution to the board that we wanted to use some of that rebate money back and um, use that towards future sustainability projects. Those numbers are going up and up and up on the amount of money that's available on the incentives, and so that will continue to be a funding source moving forward. Um, and so it will also be a funding source, hopefully, for the fleet assessment as well as for EV charging systems. 
Um, we do, I don't know if I told you guys this, but we do have, we have the one out here in Carver parking lot, and I see cars parked there. I smile every time I drive by and see that. We've also got the one operational now at Gaithersburg Middle School. Um, we are seeking funding for additional sources right now. Um, there aren't, but we have put in on a couple grants, so we'll let you know if we You say we grants. have one out there at a parking lot? Yeah. There's, so, there's, there's, there's four, there's actually. There's people charging stations out there. I have no idea, because I drive <laughs> one. That might save me someday. <laughs> yep, right that way. OK, OK. <laughs> um, OK. Yeah, I do. It's, it's really cool. And, and the, the idea, it, that was a partnership with Pepco. Um, and the idea was to put them in a place where the public would have the opportunity to use them. Yep. Um, because in a place where like there would be a lot of public um, people. Um, so the other thing is um, with the students, in terms of the students, is really activating them to help us continue to work on reducing consumption, saving energy, reducing waste, um, because that, that is something that's completely human behavior driven. And um, we, we continue to, we'll have to continue to, to have those types of student-led efforts, but also the local efforts, right? It's, it can't necessarily be something mandated from somewhere else. Having that idea and having those students create something um, really makes their school special for them. So uh, next slide, please. One of the other questions that I got from the students when we were talking about how the buildings emit greenhouse gases was, okay, are we planning on electrifying everything? Um, so we are continuing to evaluate that and seek grants for decarbonization, um, just a rough, um, order of magnitude is we, we think decarbonization might be at least 10 times more expensive than just a regular HVAC retrofit. So it's it's going to definitely need some um, extra funding. Uh, we have had three pilots that we've been worked on so far. One of them we were trying to get some grant funding for that we didn't get. Um, and then the other two were unsuccessful. So we're going to continue to work on that. Um, absolutely continue to work on it. Um, and look for new off-site opportunities as well as ad additional on-site properties for solar. Um, and I'm sure Mr. Adams already talked about our capital request. So uh, next slide, please. Our operating budget moving forward will continue to have funding requests for increased rec purchases. And last but not least, there's something out there called carbon offset credits um, because recs are really only for electricity. And so natural gas recs don't really cover that so much, but it's much less um, mature industry, I would say. Um, if you guys remember, we're already um, planting a lot of trees. We're working, we have a partnership with the county right now, and we're actually gonna celebrate that on Arbor Day. Um, but the carbon offset credits are gonna be something we have to look into a little bit more. Um, but as long as I mentioned our Arbor Day celebration, I'm going to give a shout out for all the other student activities we have going on. Um, our paper poster contest, which we mass produce one or two of the winners every year to share with the schools. That deadline's this Friday, so if anybody is still working on it, we've, we're, we're waiting for them. Um, April 13th will be MCPS's third Youth Climate Summit, the second one that's in person. It will be again at Tilden Middle School this year, and it will involve some hands-on activities for the students to engage, um, just like we had on the November 1st opportunity. April 22nd, at Loiterman and Weller Road, we're having um, student volunteer activities in coordination and collaboration with Habitat for Humanity and several other volunteer organizations. We um, also have several other speakers and attendees and people that have um, made donations or grants or contributions towards the REACH Hub at Loiterman, which is um, probably a subject for a whole other day to talk about. Um, but the students are being actively engaged in that. The other thing I want to give a shout out to my, my CERT team members is that we helped 32 of our schools, our staff, um, 32 of our schools to either work on recertification or achieve new certification for green school this year. That's an ongoing task that's very labor intensive, both at that school level for the teachers to, to put the documents together and for our staff to help um, and the community partners that we have. And last but not least, um, if you guys visit the Smith Center on any regular um, opportunity, our Poolsville High School students, the Global Ecology Program students, are actively engaged in growing plants right now. And they'll have a day later on um, this year where they go out to Smith Center and plant those plants and help us with some stormwater mitigation efforts. So that's where we are right now. Any questions? Last slide is discussion. I just, just one follow up. So this year is the first year that we've been requiring all 211 schools to create a sustainability plan. And I know getting the schools to actually do those plans and get them in was uh, Still a work in ongoing. progress. Ongoing, okay. Still a work in progress. And then there were new, the new stipend supported positions in schools for green school coordinators, sustainability coordinators. 
are those being operationalized? Um, we have a request in with the freeze exemption, the expenditure restriction committee, um, and I've, I've spoken with them, and we're hopeful to hear on that soon. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, I think we're doing a lot in MCPS, not quite as much as some, but more than most when it comes to really reducing our our carbon footprint. And I think it's really important work because our students are telling us there's a climate crisis and, 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 and climate anxiety is real. So mm -hmm. I just appreciate all the work on, on this. Thank uh, you. Because again, a lot of people don't see it. They ask all the time, why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z? And it's like, well, we are. Yeah. You bet. So, um, and the last thing on our agenda is today we are going to do a little bit of a conversation around um, our um, our DFNS and our um, enterprise funds because a lot of people you look at our budget and and there's always that that line item about the areas of our work that are enterprise funds and people are like what's an enterprise fund and do I pay for that <laughs> who pays for that what does that mean. Yep. And so we're going to learn a little bit more about that. So welcome. Well, thank you. And I've learned I should introduce myself. So I'm Elizabeth Leach. I'm the Director of Food and Nutrition Services here at MCPS. Happy to be here today to talk about our portfolio. So I know, I do believe we have a slide deck coming up. So hopefully that, oh, thank you very much. Um, I know we've been able to have a good number of conversations about CEP lately, and I'm happy to kind of dive deeper into other aspects of our portfolio as well. About what, uh, good conversations about what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm using my acronyms because I use them so fluently, but CEP is our community eligibility provision. So I know we've talked a lot about that today, or recently, and today we'll also just dive into other aspects of DFNS. Okay. So I wanted to start with our meal participation. So you can see on our first slide, if we switch to the next slide, that our trends from the beginning of this school year from July through February show that we've seen a pretty significant increase in meal participation compared to last year. We've seen a 17% increase in breakfast and a 16% increase in lunch. And what we, we anticipated this in some schools, right? So we anticipated seeing this in CEP schools where we're serving free breakfast and lunch to students that we weren't serving it free before. We also anticipated seeing this in schools that newly adopted the MMFA program, which is a Maryland Meals for Achievement, meaning they're receiving free breakfast. What we didn't anticipate and we were really excited to see is really increases in almost all other schools as well. And when we dug in to find out why, because we were excited about that, um, you know, we know coming out of the pandemic, this year has been a really stabilizing year. We had a lot of years where our menu fluctuated, we had supply chain challenges, our menu offerings had to change dramatically, and so we've been able to really stabilize the menu offerings and the consistency across our schools, um, and obviously we've seen that impact directly by students engaging in our meals. And give a shout out to Sammy, because he's been out at the school too, <laughs> talking about meals. So. He sure has. I mean, he, he, when he says he doesn't stop eating, he's right. That unstuffed, <laughs> incredible unstuffed potato, he keeps posting lie. about it. He would Uber. That's him. Um, so, you know, we're really excited to see these increases. We also know that there's work to continue, right? And so we know that the consistency of our meals across our 211 schools will continue to be a priority. And I just want to name a couple of ways that we are focusing on that. First is staffing. Um, so we know that if we are not fully staffed at a school or if someone calls out and we don't have a substitute to go there, that that impacts our menu and our meal offerings. And as you heard Mr. Hall say earlier, in our FY25 budget, we plan for increased cafeteria workers and staff to support that. Um, and we're actively recruiting and hiring and onboarding to make sure we are fully staffed. Another tool that we're working with our EGPS partners is to re-take pictures of all of our menu items. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, it hasn't been taken in a while, sometimes since pre-pandemic, and, and we know that's a tool for our cafeteria workers and managers to say, this is the recipe, this is exactly what it should look like at every school. Um, and similar to what a lot of the other restaurants in Montgomery County do is provide those tools to those franchises or chains or whatever you call them to make sure that it looks consistent. And something I was looking at recently, it's, it's interesting, at, with 211 locations, we are actually the fourth largest restaurant in Montgomery County. Um, and so, 
<laughs> Wait for it. Um, McDonald's. <laughs> McDonald's is up there. So Starbucks. Subway, Dunkin' Donuts, and McDonald's all have more locations than us. But Starbucks is way behind us. They have 138 locations. Um, and so if we think about the tools that they use to train their staff to market and things like that, that's what we are also doing to make sure that the quality across all of our schools maintains and is consistent um, so each student gets that high-quality nutrition. All right, next slide, please. And so, you know, we're similar to these other restaurants, but what's different is that our budget may not look like those restaurants, right? So here's a snapshot of our FY24 federal meal reimbursement rates. So this is where the majority of our revenue comes from. And I think folks here are familiar, but for everyone, the Division of Food and Nutrition Services is an enterprise fund, meaning that we are self-sustaining and we do not pull any resources from the MCPS operating budget. And so we get our revenue primarily from these meal reimbursements. When we serve a, a meal to a student, if they qualify for a free breakfast, we're getting $2.28. If they qualify for a free lunch, that's $4.35. If they don't, it's 38 cents or 50 cents. Um, and the entirety of what we expend comes out of these meal reimbursements. So um, when we talk about tools um, for our staff and professional development and marketing, that all has to fit within this. Um, and that's the challenge we face every day on how to prioritize that and make sure that it all all fits within this so um, next slide please some reminders just fiscally related there was a temporary meal reimbursement increase that ended june 30th 2023 so coming into this fiscal year we didn't have that temporary increase anymore um, we also, related to the pandemic, had supply chain assistance grants. Um, we did receive, uh, continue to receive some of those grants in this fiscal year, about $4.5 million worth. We project expending those this year. Um, and we do project a positive balance in FY24, which again, we're planning for how to reinvest that in FY25 in our staffing um, to reinvest that right back in our programs. What I also think is interesting to share is how we spend our, our funds. So the majority, as you can see, is on staff and associated staff costs, so, so benefits, fringe, things like that, at about 57%. Um, then, obviously, is food at about 37%. Um, I will say that would be a little bit higher. We also are able to purchase food through our USDA Foods Program, or what uh, was previously known as commodities. Um, so there are some funds that aren't reflected here that we purchase food with as well. And then everything else, including equipment, supplies, materials, um, is about 6% of our expenses. And so um, for those who deeply dive into the, the procurement, you know, the, the consent agenda at every board meeting, as I know <laughs> yeah. the millions in the audience do, yeah. um, uh, not uncommonly, it, it is cyclical, we will see um, a consent item for like millions of dollars for food. Mm -hmm. um, we had a big one yesterday mm -hmm. um, for yep. uh, you know, like food service Trails. supplies, Trails. Yep. which I'm like, could you something. add a sense to that so we know exactly what that is? But oh. you know, like the gloves and the hair nets and the oh. and the trays the tray and, and the buttons um, and everything. And so when we raise our hands for that procurement item, mm -hmm. that is not coming from the MCPS operating budget. It's coming from your MCPS. enterprise fund. Correct. Um, although I don't think, I'm looking at Mr. Riley. I'm not sure the memos, but that, that is something that we really should include in those I procurement item men, mm -hmm. items. So the public can see this is not coming out of your operating budget. This yep. is coming from whichever enterprise fund it is. In this case, for yesterday's item, it would have been yours. Absolutely. But we do have a few other yeah. enterprise funds. Yeah. And um, I think, and you know, when we talk about the enterprise fund as something that's self-sustaining, um, and, and it is very, very cyclical, it's, I think it's important for people to, pe very few people understand that. And so it's good that you're here talking about that. And I think we, I just think we can do a better job on, on the routine, mm -hmm way standard operating procedure documents we produce that just have that one sentence on there. Um, so people, the, the you know, the, the taxpayers the know. Yeah. Yeah. Where's it coming from? On the bottom. Yeah. yeah. That seems Absolutely. easy enough and a way to be transparent and communicative and yeah, yeah I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Very good. Great idea. All right, well, you led us right to procurement, which is where I was going next. I wanted to highlight some new contracts that we entered this year. So next slide, please. We are very excited. We engaged 
in a rigorous competitive RFP process early in this fiscal year, which resulted in um, contracting with a new produce company, Keeney Produce. Um, we started with them November 1st. And while we had a really strong partnership with our last produce company, we'd been with them for about 15 years, so they were supporting our schools. We also identified a need to enhance what we're offering to students. And so what this contract is able to do for us is that Keeney now delivers produce directly to all of our secondary schools, all of our middle schools and high schools, cutting out a delay in getting fresh food to students. So previously, um, yeah, that, that food was coming to our warehouse, our central production facility, and then we were driving it out to schools um, because that was what a, a vendor could support us in. And now we found a vendor that can deliver directly to all of our secondary schools. So. Um, you can see those bananas that was actually very recently at Ashburn oh. Elementary School. Um, but, you know, they were at perfect ripeness, ripeness on that day. Um, I was really surprised and Did excited to see that the kids were eating the bananas before the pizza because we know Friday's pizza day, right? And they were eating the bananas even before the pizza. How often do they deliver to school? It depends on the school and their okay. volume and frequency. So we have a whole schedule. So okay. it varies. Um, mm. I th believe it's about twice a week for oh. for secondaries, but I would okay. have to fact check that for because, uh, yeah. it, it, again, it varies on their volume as well. Additionally, so in addition to awarding that contract, we also entered a contract with Moon Valley Farm, who is our neighbor, they're right over the border in Frederick County. They are not just a local farm, but a local farm aggregator. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to purchase from other local farms, which has been really beneficial because we know the volume that we provide. Um, working with small local farms, that's one of our challenges. And so this has been a great step in that Ooh. direction to say, how can we develop partnerships mm -hmm. to systemically make sure that we are increasing the amount of local local foods that we are serving in our meals. And Moon Valley Farm has been able to provide us different varietals of apples. So we have served Pink Lady, uh, Cameo, Golden Delicious. Every elementary school student has gotten these on their menus since we started with them in December. I am so happy about that. Right. I, years ago, I, I don't know, we started a, um, a committee, you know, one of those com <laughs> commissions so that we just so like to have. Um, but, you know, it was... Um, some people from the county, myself, and our legislative director at the time, um, and a ton of different farmers, uh, you know, our farm heads, owners, um, to talk about ways that we could actually get fresh produce into our schools. And it always dumbfounded me how complicated it, <laughs> it seemed like it was and, you know, and for me, you know, they like a lot of one of the issues was always, well, we don't have one vendor that can provide for everyone. Like, so use six different farms. It doesn't like, why does that matter? But um, so I'm just very happy to see that we finally have figured out <laughs> ways to utilize. And particularly if it's possible to incorporate any of our Montgomery County farms, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Even our, we've got, um, here in Montgomery County, we've got farms that do milk and stuff like that, so. Yeah. And you're so right, it is unfortunately more complicated than, <laughs> than it needs to be, but what I'm excited about also is that these are steps in the right direction. We're also working with Montgomery County Food Council who has a grant, so we are working collaboratively with them and the Montgomery County farmers to develop an action plan, again, mm. to more systemically incorporate local foods into mm. our into our school meals. So, yeah. wonderful. And I think, you know, big picture, one of the plans for, and I'm so excited about this project, and, tr you know, props again to Harris Traubman in sustainability. Mm -hmm. So the Loiterman, the, the um, urban sustainability, you know, farm and sustainability hub, the plan long term is that the lunchroom there is going to compost, and they're going to be, which will be directly used in, in the the growing of food, and that food's going to go into the cafeteria. Yep, we've talked. So about it's about just that. so yeah, yeah. exciting. Exactly. I mean, not I'm talking. I can't get any more local than that. That's right, right now, <laughs> right outside. That's right. Grow yeah. your own. Yeah, <laughs> there's where the carrots came from. So yeah, it's just an exciting project. It is. All right, next slide, please. So. I also wanted to share an update mm -hmm. on a new software that I know we purchased last year. Yep. It's called Edison. So yeah. we have been developing this software um, or customizing the software rather with our contractor 
throughout this whole fiscal year. And so this software will do a lot for us on the back, on, back end of holding menu items, recipes, menus, um, and give us additional functionality that we haven't had in the past. Mm -hmm. What Where we're at right now is that we are piloting it with 12 schools. We did a training in early March. Mm -hmm. So 12 schools are piloting it. We brought our cafeteria managers in and mm -hmm. trained them on this new software. Mm -hmm. And they are going through the, the steps of using it every day so we can mm -hmm. figure out the kinks and, and fix anything. Mm -hmm. um, we will be providing professional development to all cafeteria managers on April 10th, April 22nd, our non-school days, mm -hmm. as well as in May, um, so that all of our schools will get up to speed utilizing the software in the spring. Mm -hmm. And what that will lead us to is that next year, mm -hmm. we will be able to roll out the public facing part of the software, which is Meal Viewer. And what Meal Viewer does, you can see a snapshot there, but really it'll take Take our current PDF menus yeah. and those will those will go away and we will have this online interactive software menu where people can go on a browser or on a smartphone they can hover over a menu item to see nutrition's uh, nutrition information allergens um, they can click there's just a, a wonderful amount of resources there so we're very excited and we're also taking steps to do it in a way that we want to make sure will roll out successfully because we know this is a really big change mm -hmm. for our, our team, our how we operate, and has a big impact on the information we provide publicly. So, so happy to be able to, to share that where we are in the process. This is very exciting. So I'm trying to envision in an elementary school, right? I've been mm -hmm. to a lot of elementary school cafeteria along that line. They have a, a lot of places have a big menu posted on the wall. Yep. And then the kids walk by and Typically, they don't look at a menu. They look what's <laughs> what's what's there. But, yeah. But the parents are the ones, you know, go on the menu. So they will be going, they will be home and looking at this on on the app or on the on a browser. Yeah. And as you can see on the right, it's very small, but on the top right corner, you can see a print functionality. So mm -hmm. for those elementary school families who still yeah. want to print it and post it up on their fridge, you know, there's that capability. And right. this will combine in our secondary mm -hmm. schools. Our mm -hmm. plan is to use uh, to project these up on screens, TVs um, yeah, that are yeah. that are ahead of the serving line when you walk in. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And in our elementary schools, you know, this will pair with our line signage. Um, mm -hmm. So we know we've been doing line signage and we have continued evolution of that. That, mm -hmm. um, but this will be a tool in, in pairing with that. Is this a step towards you being able to order your pre-order your food online as well? That's not something we've talked about right now. I know mm -hmm. that there are school districts doing that. That's that's not something we um, mm -hmm. have approached. So we talked about it years ago when, oh. um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, the problems we were having with kids getting backed up at. at lunchtime and not having enough time to eat by the time they get mm, through the lines. Yeah. Yeah. So we're trying to come up with different ways of mm. making, uh, addressing that. Um, yeah. This was one of the things, but I just, when this looks so much like you could probably click on it after you've <laughs> scanned it and everything else that um, I was hopeful maybe. Well, at our elementary schools, do pre-order for the day of. Mm -hmm. So they take their in the orders morning, right? in yeah. the classroom. It goes into mm -hmm. Synergy. Mm -hmm. So our cafeteria managers get those orders and mm -hmm. prepare. But it's not paid for. It's not so paid. they still have to stand there and, and um, punch, in their, punch in their number or right. scan their cards. Correct. Which is what mm -hmm. takes so long, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our team is working and thinking about concepts to help make sure we can provide meals to students in a sufficient amount of time for them to eat. And particularly with our secondary students who um, might appreciate a grab-and-go style or a bento box or something that yeah. they can take and then go back. You know, we're exploring different types of menu items that could potentially help in that capacity and would be appealing to students. Yeah. I also think we should do kiosks throughout the high schools or what, like, so it's not just one location where everybody's going to get their food. So they have to pay for it first, though. <laughs> they well, well, I, oh, oh, I mean, oh, um, Ms. Rondowski is absolutely right, because mm -hmm. one of the things that we know, especially in our high schools, mm -hmm. the, you know, we have high schools, many, that were built of a different era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I went to high school, we had lunch periods, and you went during your lunch period. It wasn't this huge en masse mm -hmm. lunch time. Mm -hmm. And so we have, you know, high school cafeterias that, and some of them, it's, it's really a challenge because they are not built to handle mm -hmm. everybody coming to lunch at once. Yep. And so uh, the kiosk idea having for some of those, those, those cafeterias is, 
such a common sense idea to eliminate that crush of people, yeah. the, the ongoing appointment, well, there's nothing left by the time I get through the line. And yeah. that shouldn't be happening anyway because we should be right-sizing our ordering and hopefully this software will help with supply chain management um, so that you know cafeteria managers can see among the menu items there, what are the, what are the students you know are most you know in demand, but also in ways to to kind of market and share all the new things so students really can see, um, and not just you know robotically grab what they always grab, but without looking at maybe what else is there, and that gets to some of the new signage too. Yeah. But um, I think for some of our school, if if we're going to continue, always sitting in the hallways anyway to eat their food. So <laughs> if if we're going to continue with high schools just have one lunch period, we really need to rethink our lunch rooms, mm -hmm. and that you know some of the work that you're doing now could help make reimagining them possible. Yeah. yeah. Instead of just why all the reasons oh we can't do that. Well, if maybe. you ever attend our national. Uh, NSBA conference or whatever, there's always um, food people, you know, what do you call it, vendors mm -hmm. um, there that you could steal a couple some ideas from <laughs> yeah. since we do it all of ourselves, but, you know, on just ways of having kiosks that specialize in one type. So, you know, if salads. I want, right, if I want a salad, I go over here. If I want mm. um, pizzas, I, I get it over this way or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. more like a university. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, functioning in a... Sorry, totally sidetracked you. No, <laughs> right. But it's you know, exciting to imagine. Yes. <laughs> He's right. always talking about the food, so... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we know that that's an, a wonderful opportunity, and you'll be excited to hear that we do have 14 kiosks on order right now. Oh, yeah. I know 14 doesn't spread to all schools, and we're starting with those schools, the secondary schools that have onboarded with the Maryland Meals for Achievement uh -huh. breakfast program, because we can both utilize it at breakfast and capture the students when they come in. Mm -hmm. You know, we know if a student has to go all the way down to the cafeteria, wherever that may be, we may lose their interest. And mm -hmm. so utilizing it both for breakfast mm -hmm. and for lunch could be an option. We do have to weigh the, the staffing considerations and things like that, and just, again, make sure that we can financially support that right. moving forward. But we have 14 on order That's right exciting. now. Yeah. Um, so Look we're excited to, to see how that, that goes. Yeah, us too. Yeah. At, yeah. And that was all I had to share, yeah. but happy to answer any additional questions that may folks may have. Nope, I'm good. This well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Thank Leish. You. I know we're running over. Can I just talk briefly about the other enterprise funds? Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Oh, my gosh. I forgot about that. Yep. That was exciting. I hate to end a meeting on a <laughs> downer or... <laughs> Yeah. Take away some well, we have high expectations. You need to follow that, okay? Yeah. We have high expectation for you. Um, th there should be a presentation. It's just a one slider. Um, on, yes, next slide. Um, so I, I don't want to turn this into a governmental accounting course, but I do want to put the, our enterprise funds in perspective of the other funds that we have. So what you're looking at is the, all the different funds that, are, that we present in our annual comprehensive financial report. It's a total of 10 different funds, and, and I'll give a brief explanation of each. Um, but you know, you know the, uh, the budget that we do every year, right? That's our plan. Mm. But our annual comprehensive report mm. is talking about what we spend mm. on an annual basis and how that compared to budget as well as are we doing everything in accordance with our auditing rules. Um, so those funds up there, if you look at the total annual spend in all of them, you know, we talk about a $3.3 billion budget. Our annual spend in those is $4.5 billion, uh, which equates to about $17.9 million a day, $2.2 million an hour. So in the time that we've been sitting here, our system has spent about $5 million, just to put it in perspective there. That's, insane. That's amazing. <laughs> Can you say those numbers again? Um, so so 4.5 billion is what we spend as a system across all the different funds. And I'll give a brief explanation of each of them, and then I'll just kind of talk a little bit briefly about the different enterprise funds. So 4.5 billion, it's, it's $2.2 million an hour is what it comes out to. Um, so, uh, so this is how it's presented on our annual financial report. And you'll see up top there, 
the, the, the accounting gurus uh, distinguish between our government-wide statement funds and our fiduciary funds. Mm -hmm. um, so when we do our annual budget, it's everything that's in blue and orange. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the, uh, if you look down along the bottom, it's our, government, it's our general fund, which are includes our operating fund, our restricted, and our unrestricted, which is our restricted is our grant fund and our normal operating fund. That's our governmental fund. Also, you'll see our capital projects fund. So we report on that on an annual basis in our financial report. Um, you know, capital projects are capital projects. When you, we talk about the CIP, that's our six-year plan for capital projects. But here, we're talking about what was spent for those capital projects in that particular year. So the capital projects, that's the first year in the CIP. And that's what we report on on an annual basis. The next item there is you'll hear we talked briefly about instructional TV. That's a special revenue fund, and that's the case where we get uh, money from the county that supports some of our TV uh, folks. And we had some changes in that because uh, we know cable TV, um, when the people using cable TV went down over the last year, so that's actually decreasing that fund. Um, then in the next section there, well, and then I just want to just point to Educational Foundation. Mm -hmm. That you'll find in our annual comprehensive report because they are a component unit of us. Uh, a component unit by definition is that it gets reported in the primary government function, um, usually because there's some kind of association. So we have board members on that uh, educational foundation. So when there's a you know mixed board members, or uh, when we have some control over their revenue, um, so or uh, so the revenue that the educational foundation earns kind of goes to us. Um, so that's why they're considered a component unit, just like we're a component unit of the of Montgomery County. We're we're on their uh, annual financial report too. Um, so then this so then the other area is business activities, and in business activities in governmental uh, accounting language, those are proprietary funds. And in proprietary funds, you can have internal service funds, which is our employee benefit plan, just bringing it back to the first topic this morning. Um, and then you have our enterprise funds. So we have four enterprise funds in MCPS. Uh, Liz just talked about our food nutritional services. Um, uh, which is the largest one, by the way, too. Uh, just a, another definition, you know, now that we're in government accounting class. So an enterprise fund is a proprietary type fund that is used to report an activity for which a fee is charged to external users. So that's the formal definition. So we charge students uh, a fee for lunch. So that's what kind of puts it in that enterprise fund. Mm -hmm. um, but these other ones we do as well, too. So starting with the field trip fund, um, this is we charge uh, for field trips. So that's why we consider that an enterprise fund. In fact, all of the revenue within that field trip fund is uh, from user fees. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things in the food and nutritional services actually has turned around. With all that additional federal revenue, mm -hmm. they're actually operating in, in the black. They, we have a surplus there. All the other three are negative, and, oh. and it's largely related to COVID. So for field trips, as, as we all know, um, we didn't really do any field trips during COVID. So okay. since then, Field Trip Fund has been trying to, uh, you know, kind of get back into the mm -hmm. black and, and mm -hmm. kind of earn more than they spend. Because as, as Liz mentioned, the Enterprise Fund is really like a business activity. Mm -hmm. It should be self-supporting. Mm -hmm. So right now it's operating in a negative because mm -hmm. um, part of the issue is not only uh, did we stop doing field trips during that time, mm -hmm. um, but the price we charge mm -hmm. um, is kind of hard to increase because our users are, you know, mm -hmm. our students. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the field, so that that's operated out of the Department of Transportation. So we're trying to kind of um, just like the uh, active, just like the uh, health insurance fund, we're trying to make that back into a positive. But it's it's taken a little while. Um, from an accounting perspective, our auditors don't necessarily like that our enterprise funds, the three enterprise funds, are operating in negative um, because they. It, they, they're going to tell us, hey, you've got to increase those fees. Yeah. Otherwise, is it really an enterprise fund? It's mm -hmm. not really self-supporting mm -hmm. uh, because it can only be negative for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, item there is the an entrepreneurial fund. So we've mentioned that a few times this morning even when we talked about the, um, the camera bus. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have that three-party agreement with the mm -hmm. police department, and we were able to uh, furnish our buses with cameras as part of this three-party agreement. Mm -hmm. But also part of that is we do the account for um, you know getting in the uh, uh, 
there's estimates on what those fines are. Mm -hmm. So we do the accounting mm -hmm. for the fines, and mm -hmm. then we get it to, you know, we distribute that. Mm -hmm. So it's just an activity within that mm -hmm. entrepreneurial fund. Mm -hmm. But another, some other ones that, you know, mm -hmm. you're probably aware of for the entrepreneurial is um, our Taylor Science Center. Those science kits are part of this entrepreneurial fund. So we charge fees for that. Our EGPS, the print shop, is an example of something as, mm. as part of the entrepreneurial fund. Okay. Uh, again, because COVID, it kind of put uh, those two funds uh, in the negative and we're still trying to catch up. Same thing with real estate management. So real estate management's run out of Seth Adams shop. Um, and that's where I think we have about 20 properties that okay. we lease out to folks. Mm -hmm. uh, again, same thing during COVID, there were uh, instances where people couldn't pay the rent. So the real estate management fund suffered. Um, and then this is another case too, where we set the lease rates, uh, but where we're usually the tenants are partners of ours. So it's hard to kind of increase those rates um, out of the blue. Usually we have three year agreements. Um, so it, it's gonna take some time as well too. So, uh, so again, those, the four orange there are those entrepreneurial okay. funds. I just wanted to kind of put it in context and just to wrap up from what we were talking about this morning. So fiduciary funds, we have a fiduciary responsibility to oversee, just like we were saying this morning, mm -hmm. retirement and pension system. That's okay. our pension fund. There's our other post-employment, there's our OPEB fund up there mm -hmm. too. So we report on that on an annual basis, um, but it's, uh, there's no, you know, it, it's not really considered a government-wide fund. It's, it's a separate fund. So that's the story of our funds, so. Um. Oh boy. <laughs> Yeah. That was very informative. Thank you. Mr. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody tuning in just learned a lot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> very yeah. informative. So any other questions from my colleagues? No. Okay. I think we are good. Um, good meeting meeting. I am always am so appreciative of the work and the way this um, the, the meetings that we're able to, to design here really, I think, help inform. Um, people who Absolutely. take the time to listen in. Um, anyway, thank you, everybody, and yes. we are adjourned. We will be scheduling a, a la another meeting before the end of the fiscal year, several things that we're going to have to, uh, business items we're going to have to take care of and things that we want to highlight, like a fuller look at that um, review of our property portfolio alongside our Department of General Services colleagues mm -hmm. to see um, are there... Is there possibly some revenue we can realize there because we just have properties we, we no longer need to be responsible for? So um, anyway, more work to do. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. We're adjourned. <laughs>